All right, gentlemen, this is the episode we've been waiting for. This is the episode I know a lot of our fans have been waiting for. I mean, I feel like it's been, it's been, we've waited so long for it, but finally, like to, to engage with it, to spend time in that world, to see the world that a master, a genius has created for us, and just to share it with you. I couldn't think of a better Christmas gift. So, yeah, I mean, to spend any amount of time in the world, the, the sort of uncannily rendered, beautiful sort of science fiction reality of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Fellas, your thoughts. I mean, we like, it's just, I'm stunned. I'm stunned. I'm speechless. Yeah. Like I, I mean, like we all had huge expectations, right? You know, I think everyone did uh, just because of like the, the groundbreaking work that we've seen this creator do before. And I think I kind of speak for, I know I speak for myself and I think I'll, I speak for everyone who's going to see this, that our expectations could never do justice to what we actually saw. It's not just the beauty of the world and the imagination and the richness and the fullness of it, but it's also like the, the promise that there are things that beautiful in the world that we live in and that we can take some of that magic with us. Once we're done watching. Although I have to say, when I did finish, I was filled with a deep emptiness <laughs> when I realized that I did not live in Tulsa and that <laughs> I, I have no likelihood in the near future to visit. But you know what? It, it's you know what? It's not just it's not just the special effects, though. There's something there's something very human in this story, which suggests that all of us could be Tulsa kings or queens, you know, and look. On a previous Christmas episode, you know, we talked about the, the genius, the god, Sly Stallone, and Cobra. I didn't think that Tulsa King would be better than Cobra, but holy shit, here I am having just seen the first six episodes, and it was worth waiting th 40 years for. I mean, I said, Sly Stallone hasn't done anything since Cobra. He's just been working, he, he's only been working on Tulsa King for the last 40 years. It's taken us this That's long, but we finally it's the have. the passion project. Yeah. He created a uh, Tulsa dome uh, just outside <laughs> of the city where they've been working on this nonstop for decades. Did, did you know that um, Stallone actually worked with linguists from MIT and Harvard to create a new language that we hear and speak <laughs> in this in this uh, Paramount Plus series? <laughs> it actually sounds like a and system like, okay. of mumbles and conjunctions, but it's a totally new language he invented. <laughs> um yeah and like you know it's just the the, uni the the universe that he created in this the universe of Tulsa is so vividly rendered that people think Tulsa is a real place mm -hmm. they think it's a real city there's people who want to visit Tulsa after seeing Tulsa King and you just gotta say like no it's it's only the product it's just the product of the imagined years that created this fictional environment for Stallone to, to live and prosper in and for all of us to imbibe his lessons but if we do that, then we can make Tulsa real. I really do believe that. I believe we can all realize that we all live in Tulsa and we can live in Tulsa if we if we all want it. Yeah. No, no, uh, Matt, you're exactly right. I actually I went to a talk by uh, Mr. Stallone, and that is pretty much exactly what he said, that like even if you're not like literally a 75 year old mobster who just got out of prison yet who is curiously able to beat up everyone that he meets. <laughs> and, you know, despite being 75 and five foot four and mostly scar tissue, every woman he meets wants to fuck him. Even though we're not like literally that we, we can, we can sort of live that we can, we can take his lessons and we can take his way of being and be how he is to Tulsa in our, in our own environment. And I think that's amazing. Yes. I think that's a beautiful message. And you know what? And I don't want to hear any of the criticism that Stallone and Taylor Sheridan are engaging in tropes about the elderly. No. Because look, this is this is a real character, okay? This is not just look, I know Taylor Sheridan has said some questionable things about the elderly in the past. But I look, look any any offensive comparisons, I think they fall flat. This is a this is a work that honors, respects, and upholds elderly elderly peoples the world over and their uh, folkways. Elderly Italian people, especially. Absolutely, absolutely, uh, absolutely. There's always going to be, you know, 
critics of people who take on this world saying that they like don't understand the customs or like the traditions. But I mean, I just got to say that this is the reason this is the reason that we go on web based uh, C tier streaming services to see a new world. <laughs> this is this is why this is why we watch television on streaming based, based at Paramount Plus. This is what Paramount Plus was created for. Exactly. It took them years to create the Paramount the, the, the Paramount technology is necessary to render the universe of Tulsa. And man oh man has it paid off. So, uh, listener, you may be asking yourself now, why are we not talking about the billion dollar <laughs> movie that, <laughs> that you've been waiting for for, uh, for years for us to finally uh, see the Avatar The Way of Water and talk about the world's number one movie instead of a Paramount Plus TV series that uh, probably five people have watched? Well, look, listener. There's some complications have arisen. The gay potion that Matt dosed himself with, the dark web gay potion, Matt has had some adverse reaction to the dark web gay poison that uh, he had to had to take as a result of think, saying Herschel Walker would win the runoff election. It's true. I have been forced to stay in my home for the next week I, until I test negative for gay before I'm allowed to go into a movie theater. But as soon as I can, I promise I will go. I will I will be transported and then we can we will talk about uh Avatar. Yeah. Um we we were all responsible obviously like we all you know got tested ever since fast tested. Doctors actually said I have the most natural immunity. It's almost like I drink it every day of my life is what they said, <laughs> which I don't. I want to clarify I don't. Um but yeah, no. We we, we got to be safe. We will review this sort of like lesser not as interesting, not as exciting or creative or inventive uh, media franchise later. But, you know, we're really here. We're really here to talk about. I think I think you would call it the successor to not only Avatar, but Terminator, The Sopranos and um, let's just say Anna Karenina, too. This is a lot. This <laughs> the is the Bible, the Bible, um, Revolutionary Road, The Secret, um, the Quran. The Theravedas, or whatever the other book is called. The stuff that Buddha uh, said. By the way, I just want to correct one thing that uh, Will said. This show is not being watched by five people. It's got better ratings than House of the Dragon. Let's go. It's really? huge. A oh, better okay. world is possible. Right. Huge. I, I, okay, okay, okay. Taylor like, so, Sheridan so, so. cannot be defeated. Okay. Uh, he, okay. Has, uh, he has the algorithm for the... Uh, the lumpen American television viewer. No, not, well, not, is, not your hipsters. Well, who Matt, this is what I want to talk about. Something they can talk about on Twitter, but people who like actually sit down and watch the bulk of scripted television. He right. is their fucking uh, snake charmer, and he knows I mean, what they want. Yeah, yeah. Yellowstone. Yeah. It's is already the king been of cable renewed TV. for a second season. Uh, it's okay. So, I mean, thank God for that. I, I mean, look, I was being perhaps too dismissive of Taylor Sheridan and the Taylor Sheridan verse as well. I know Yellowstone is a huge hit and it makes, makes perfect sense that Tulsa King is also a huge hit. I meant among our listeners. Oh, yeah. None of our listeners watch this. None of our listeners watch this. They all watch you. We all know what our fucking stupid fucking listeners watch. They watch some like fucking post ironic bullshit that gets released on like i don't know you can only watch it in a laundromat you you, you have to show proof of purchase that you bought one sandwich from an ock at uh, the bodega in order to watch it they're watching whatever the fuck they're watching i don't give a shit taylor sheridan taylor sheridan as matt has alluded to is one of the new gods of tv he is an immortal being yeah. More powerful than the previous great, great one, uh, Ken Olin. Ken Olin may write, you know, sentimental comedy, quasi fucking family drama fluff for the dying generation, the boomers. OK, he may be a superstar god at that. But Taylor Sheridan, he is um, he is really zeroed in on the most important new audience, people who were born around 1980. Taylor Sheridan knows their values. He knows how they want to be thought of and portrayed. Uh, all his shows, they are about sort of morally conflicted, uh, 
So uh, guys, guys who, who are rough around the edges, but have a heart of gold. And this represents the viewers, people who are entering their early 40s and maybe have been disinvited from several family functions for some weirdly sexual comments they've made about a younger cousin's girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. This is all very appropriate for Taylor Sheridan, the new god of television, because do you guys recall where Taylor Sheridan got his start before he became the god of movies and television? That is right. Not as a yes. writer, director, or showrunner, but as an actor on the greatest TV series of all time, Sons of Anarchy, a show that I think honestly birthed Chapo Trap House. Like the three of us yes. basically connected with each other to talk about Sons of Anarchy and go on Street Fight and shoot the shit with the uh, B&B about our favorite TV show. Taylor Sheridan played the 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 sheriff of the, uh, the good or, you know, was it uh, Redwood, California? Yeah, he got immediately murked, though. They just <laughs> yeah, he wrote was killed him out of the, the show halfway through the first season. He was killed season. in yeah, the se season uh, three uh, premiere, the se episode one, season three. Yeah, so he plays. So Taylor Sheridan's character in Sons of Anarchy is named David Hale. And the head of the Charming Police Department uh, is this horrible, sort of waterlogged looking man, Unsler, whose entire reason for being a cop <laughs> is. Charlie Other. Charlie Other. He's had a crush on Gemma. Uh, for approximately seven, 78 years. She is a beautiful woman. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> she but David Hale, meanwhile, is like a real good stand-up cop, the kind of guy who rescues cats out of trees. And if he touched fentanyl, he, he can hold it out. He'll hold his breath. He'll be fine. Um, He's jacked. There is this one really, really weird scene that I can't get out of my head where Jax is on a stealth mission in the police station First thing, he's like stealing some documents. And then he sees, he sees Taylor Sheridan's character, David Hale, just nailing one of the deputies from behind. Just fucking ball slapping on thighs. Pop, pop, pop. He's just giving it to her. I don't know why they showed us that, but they did. Uh, anyway, <laughs> oh, I know. I know why. Well, we all wanted to see it, obviously. But anyway, he was a good... <laughs> he was he was a good... Gotta get some poison out of my body, Felix. Well, you know, I, some say the poison is letting it out, but um, he uh, he plays a good, he plays a good honest cop who obviously hates the Suns because they cause an excess of seven hundred murders a week and countless property damage in a town of three hundred people. A town of three hundred people that can't be making more than five hundred dollars a week. Uh, but then later he has to work <laughs> he has to work with the Suns because you know. Uh, the writers were like, who can we think of a, uh, as a villain who's like somehow worse than the Sons of Anarchy? I know a Nazi who fucks his daughter and then he dies. <laughs> but that is not the end of Taylor Sheridan, the man. He became a god. The closest thing we have to a god, a TV showrunner. Yeah. And, and, and he really is, as Matt said, he is he is the sort of the, the whisperer of like the 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 vastly underserved like red state America TV watching audience, which I think like I can tell why he's so successful because there's a moment in the, uh, the pilot episode of Yellowstone, which was like, that was his like tentpole TV property with, you know, Kevin Costner being ridiculous. And I believe on Yellowstone now, Kevin Costner is now the Republican governor of Montana on it's that. So show, stupid. Which is it's great. Awesome. But, it, but in the pilot episode of Yellowstone, Kevin Costner's daughter like the sort of Lady Macbeth style, sort of cold-blooded, you know, he's got he's got a lot of like icy cold-blooded women who are sort of very mercenary and sort of promiscuous. It's a, it's a running theme here. But uh the Kevin Costner's uh the 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 sort of uh the princess of the ranch is at a like a, a sort of swanky hotel bar in Bozeman, Montana, which is sort of the 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 cool college town in Montana. And a guy Bozeman at a bar actors. starts hitting on her. Yeah, I fucking hate, I hate Bozeman people so much. Uh, but there's a guy at the bar who's hitting on her. And he's like, you know, just like politely trying to buy her a drink. And then for no reason, she shuts him down by saying so, like something about like, let me guess, like, you know, uh, you moved out here from California to like live the real lifestyle. Well, let me tell you something, buddy. You look like a soft fuck. And then walks Ooh. away. And I was like, OK, yeah. I, now I understand why this is the number one show on TV because nobody watching it wants to imagine that they're a soft fuck, but you better believe Kevin Costner 
is laying hard pipe because he's a man of the old school. And that is what Taylor Sheridan shows are all about. It's about the, the clash in values and morality between sort of the, the Western male archetypes and what does that mean in a modern uh, sort of pussified soy world. And, yeah. and, and now with Tulsa King, he adds to that mix, what happens when you take old, the old school masculinity of the uh, American Northeast and the Italian uh, organi- ma- mafia and organized crime and brought it into a setting, the fictional city of Tulsa? Well, you pointed out something very important about the Taylor Sheridan verse, you know, old versus new uh, reaction versus the new world. But I think another I think the primary reason that Sheridan is so successful and his projects are so big is because his protagonists, his heroes represent uh, the viewers in that the viewers are the types of people who wear those shirts that you buy on Facebook that are like, I may be the black sheep of the family, but I'm the one you call when shit gets tough. You know, yes, that, that's yes, that like, is every that's protagonist on for. one of his shows. Yeah, it's like literally it's all for uh, people who are like, oh, I may be the worst member of this family, but I can sure get you Adderall. <laughs> That isn't really Adderall, but my friend made it. <laughs> no, it's like everyone in the family may hate me, but if someone were trying to kill that family, they would call me. Yeah, it's people who I fantasize. Sort it it's people who like fantasize about their family being kidnapped so they could like save them and get invited back to Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're like the the solution to all of their uh, their relationship problems is a home invasion that they get to court. <laughs> yes, ex- yes. <laughs> It is. It's sort of like the 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 adult outgrowth of um, fantasizing about stopping a school shooting so you can finally have sex when you're in high school. Well, so like, like you know, uh, so Taylor Sheridan, like uh, heretofore, his shows are sort of about the, the folk ways of uh, criminals and their sort of old, old school customs and existing in the modern world. Old, like, you know, the, the old West meets the new West. And in this show, Tulsa King, the formula is what it, what happens when the old East meets the new West. It is a show about uh, mafia capo Dwight Manfredi, named after Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight the General Manfredi, who is released from prison after serving a 25-year stretch after like, doing a murder for his like mafia family that he, he's like, I kept my mouth shut. I kept my mouth shut for 25 years. Literally the years. only mob guy in history facing yeah. a 25 year <laughs> sentence who didn't flip yeah. immediately. Mob, yeah. Yeah, and mob the show makes, will, a, makes a big deal out of that. When mob guys get pulled over, when mob guys get like moving violations, they give up the entire structure of their family. <laughs> it's amazing how little, well, how little they give credit. They give this guy for doing yeah, something that no other mafia guy has ever done. So, yeah, the, the show begins and it's, it's the loan and he's, he's it's like, you know, first day out the feds and, you know, like he uh, he's just on a 25 year jail stretch. And he's like, you know, uh, hoping that he's going to be like warmly embraced by his like, you know, the mafia family that he just sacrificed 20 a quarter century of his life for. But like, you know, like there's all this like uh, he emerges from jail. There's like a scene where he's like driving through Manhattan. He's being chauffeured through Manhattan and he's like looking with a uh, bemused puzzlement at things like uh, <laughs> the city bike, soul cycle, <laughs> the new world trade center, the Apple store. He's like, I would have two buildings. Yeah. That was just one building. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, like, what happened know, to he, the ground past- zero mosque? <laughs> <laughs> I used to, I used to love to pray there. <laughs> so I received to Umar. He's got, he's got like, uh, I kept my mouth shut all these years. I married this life. Now I'm going to see if this life married me back. <laughs> and uh, he gets his answer early on because he's uh, his chauffeur is uh, he, he just sort of like cruises by scores, the famous strip club in New York. And he's like, hey, we're, we're going to go to scores. This is going to be a party. There no, will be not- a party for me in scores. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, Dwight Manfredi. You're not getting a, uh, a stripper party for your first day out of prison. You're going to be chauffeured to the world's ugliest mansion on Long Island to be to immediately go into the worst meeting ever with like the shittiest mafia family that's ever existed or been portrayed. Oh, on oh, like just gross. <laughs> the, dude, the sons of anarchy of mob families. Will, I put this in my no- this is the first thing I wrote down in my notes, and I just wrote um, the phlegm meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a bo- <laughs> it's like a bohemian grove for guys who need auric vacuums to suck their mucus out. 
<laughs> it's like the shitty the world's shittiest mafia family and now like uh like the 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 boss who has like some you know some sort of like uh <laughs> he has sleep he has like a fucking CPAP machine he's taking hits off of and shit but like his son who was like 10 years old when uh dwight went to went to prison is now he's like hey uh, uh, Dwight, uh, uh, Chiki's my underboss now. What do you think you can send him? Okay, the underboss is played by uh, Dominic um, Lombardazzi. Lombardazzi. From Lombardazzi, who you may remember, you know, he was he yeah. was in The Wire, you know, uh, he was uh, he was in uh, yeah, fucking The Irishman. But here's the thing. If you, if you know the guy I'm talking about, he has a very specific sort of like cue ball head. They give him the worst <laughs> wig I have ever seen. Like, why why does this character have hair? He's got a full head of hair, and it just like it's it, it's. If you're aware of this actor, it, it is like okay. If you weren't aware that he was totally bald, then you're just wondering what the fuck is on this guy's head. And then if you are aware of what this guy looks like, every time you look at him, you're just like, why the choice for this guy? Why does it's he have wild? Hair? It's like they just stapled a squirrel pelt to his head. <laughs> Not since Corey Stahl in The Strain. Yes. Has oh, there been so a more bald ass motherfucker inexplicably <laughs> given a terrible hairpiece? And at least on, yeah. and on that show, they gave up like halfway through the first <laughs> season and had him shave his head. Matt, are we in real strain hours right now? Oh, yeah. You know, you know, we are. You know, we're, <laughs> we're in real strain hours. hours right now. Um, Felix, actually, the, the, the first note I had, because I, I, I rewatched this for the show today. The, the only thought I had, I don't know why, and I just had this intrusive thought that the show should be called Lindy King. And the show is about a Paul Scalis fan getting out of prison and like, you know, uh, trying to make his way in the 4HL and uh, fighting the 1YKAE or something. <laughs> shout out I'm to just Paul. Thinking like, it's shout a show about Paul. a guy who's Lindy. Yeah. It's a show oh about God. a Lindy man. It's a show about a Lindy man. It is a show about a Lindy man. Well, dude, okay. Because like when he went to jail, things were still Lindy. And he gets out of jail, everything is not Lindy anymore. No, no, okay, no. Shout out to Paul. A lot of people don't know this. Paul has followed me and corresponded with me because we're both fight fans since like 2013. I, I, dude, I was on the Lindy train before anyone. But like, shout out to Paul. If you're Lindy, if you you follow the Lindy principles, you go to prison for 25 years. You get out. You're fine because okay, you're you're still only doing Lindy things. You're still only doing things the ancients did. Okay, so it's not like you're you're gonna just start using an iPad now. If you if you're out well, there, if you're I mean a listener, if you're going to prison for 20 years, if you did something really bad. Better start getting Lindy. Well, I mean, the funny thing is, like, he goes, he goes to jail. He probably went to he went to jail in like 1999 or something. So, like, mm-hmm. you know, right at the end of history. And then it's just like, no, like it, he didn't go to jail in like the 1950s. You know, he gets out of jail. He's like, what, what's this noise? And it's like rap music or something. It's like, no, that existed in 19. 19- yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like, they, they, they push, his yeah, references are still in like far. the 1950s. He's like, hey, now this year is real music, and it's like, you know. D- Dean Martin or the Stones or something. Yeah, they push it a little far. Um, like he's like he sees he sees like a woman in jeans and he's like, hey, what the fuck? Does her husband let her do that? <laughs> so for his troubles, for marrying the game, for being faithful to the game for twenty five years, what is his reward from his mafia family? They're like, hey, Dwight, you know things ain't been so good lately. You know you can't. There's not really a place for you here in New York. We got about you know uh, six fake jobs left. We have about six <laughs> no show union jobs for every fucking Italian mob guy in New York left. So your reward for your years of loyalty is you get to set up a new mob franchise in the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then like you know he reacts to that news by. Uh, Again, as a 75-year-old man, like, one-shotting this much younger man, knocking him out cold because he's got no respect. He's got no respect. He's, uh, this guy's mouth is running off. He's got no respect. He knocks, there is- like, they, he, so he knocks out the... Hey, he's a capo! Oh! But then he's like, yeah, okay, I'll go to Tulsa. He doesn't put up much of a fight. He's like, okay. The next scene, he's in Tulsa. If there is a character that this literally on-screen 75-year-old man cannot beat up, we have not met him. <laughs> like he he is a so, force. Yeah, he's he a you know he's an old, he's an old school guy, and like the point is that even the mob isn't Lindy anymore. You know, like they're mm-hmm. they're, they're they they got fucking uh, Fitbits and fucking <laughs> they've gone woke. Uh, they've yeah, gone woke, folks. They've got yeah they've got the woke mind virus now. Yeah, why you know why did um, the mafia so, yeah. go woke? They went broke. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
he decamps from uh, Long Island to the you know the the middle of the Great Plains of America in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So it's a it's a real fish out of water story. He uh, arrives at the airport and like a like a cricket jumps on him and he's like, oh, what the what the hell is that? And like some nice lady is like, oh, it's just a it's June bug. And he goes, that's bigger than my cock. And then she spritzes him with holy water and he's like, whoa, 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 what's going on? <laughs> I'm going to be doing a lot of my Stallone voice on the show. It's so hard not to do. He, uh, he, <laughs> he gets spritzed with holy water and then meets like, and then it meets like the second lead on the show. Uh, the first black guy who hasn't been trying to stab him for the last, the, guy, the first black guy he's met in 25 years who hasn't been trying to kill him. And he's just like, oh, okay. why don't you take me to, take me to a hotel? And like he immediately befriends this like younger, cool black guy and hires him as his chauffeur. This scene is awesome. Like, I mean, how could it not be? But it, it, it's like every every bit of like bad racial buddy comedy. I, I guess <laughs> if you wrote if you if you went to prison for 25 years and this was the last scene you wrote before you went in, it would make a lot of sense <laughs> because it'll be like it, it'll be shit like uh, Sloan will be like, hey, just take me to the best place in town. And um, the black guy goes. Oh, so you're a gangster. And he goes, I'm not a gangster. You can't go around calling everybody a gangster. And the guy goes, no, gangster means cool. Like, gangster is just what just what I say. And Sloan goes, you got to check your fucking grandma, which I also made a note of. <laughs> because, like, if anyone is it's having trouble with grammar, <laughs> it's, it's not him. <laughs> it's perhaps the most inaudible man who's ever lived. <laughs> so it's like I mean like his his mafia family they were just like yeah here's a plane like or don't even like you buy your own plane ticket to Tulsa nothing is set up there but they're like yeah you gotta kick five thousand dollars a week back to us it's like what like what is he gonna do there just see the fucking sites well no not Dwight the general Manfredi the first thing he does even before he goes to a hotel is he uh, comes across a legal marijuana dispensary. Now, this becomes a major part of the plot, and it introduces our third lead, played by Martin Starr from Party Down and other various comedies, The you know, sort of like as the stand-in for the kind of the new world uh, millennial, sort of like nerd, stoner, kind of like a guy who could not be more different. Like the, the world in his frame of reference could not be more different than Stallone. So here's a question that I had. Uh, this is a legal business. This is a legal marijuana dispensary. <laughs> and, 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 and Stallone immediately just starts extorting him for protection money. But like from who? It's legal. <laughs> the way, like, the, goes, way he got the, like the way he explains, okay, like he goes, the way the writing the gangs. of the show, and he goes, "What gangs?" <laughs> the, the That's the that, thing is, like, the show doesn't even give a justification. Like, he doesn't even give one, and it's like that's fine. He's a dumb, you know, mook or whatever. But the guy just gives him the money and then does not call the cops. Sorry, my cat was acting a fool. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, so like, he's just like the the way he the way he ex like the way you the, the way I was. This was explained to me the viewer I was watching. Like, how are you as a member of organized crime able to like extort a legal drug business for protection when they can just call the cops and be like, hey, there's this Italian asshole who's trying to take me down <laughs> for money, and they'd be like, well, yeah, obviously you're <laughs> you're a licensed vendor. So he just the way he explains it to Martin Starr's character is that, hey, look, you may got a lot of money in the safe, but, like, the feds could take it away from you at any minute. I guess so, he, like, was he just reading... has, like, a half million dollars in cash in a safe, but he's like, hey, you know, you got to start laundering that. So he's like, he was not committing crimes before he met this guy, and then now he's in a, involved in a money laundering operation with this dude to, to wash his money that, like, apparently the feds can just take because it's still illegal at a federal level. I don't know. It did not make much sense to me. But you, it has an opportunity for a lot of wonderful bands between Sly and Martin Starr. What a mismatched comic duo they make. I will say Martin Starr, uh, a Chapo all-star, just uh, one of the greats, amazing on Party Down, one of the funniest characters. Um, but yeah, this is <laughs> the laundering money thing, as, as you have pointed out, raises many more questions than it answers. Um do we think that when Stallone's character was in prison, he was reading intercept articles about Jeff Sessions' <laughs> DOJ doing civil forfeiture dispensaries in red states? I don't know. Hard also, to say. Also, 
You know what would really get the FBI more likely to uh, seize your uh, assets? If you're uh, colluding with a fucking uh, uh, convicted mafia guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess like, yeah, like maybe the feds could steal all your, your legal marijuana cash. But like it just it still doesn't make any sense why Martin Starr's character just like acquiesces to this ongoing business relationship. Because he's a fucking millennial <laughs> bitch. That's yes. why. Yeah. Well, the show goes to great lengths. And I actually really like the way the show goes to great lengths to be like, actually, Martin Starr really did need the, the partnership and help of an experienced Italian-American gentleman who has, uh, you know, work experience in the crime related fields. Like when they go into their next big business, you want to talk about Sons of Anarchy, low, Sons of Anarchy style low rent crimes. Uh, but another big part of the show is uh, cornering the nitrous oxide market at festivals in Oklahoma. <laughs> 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 yeah oh my god that has to be dozens this is, this is of dollars big, a week he, he in has, profit he has a legal weed dispensary which probably prints like a hundred grand in profit like a week or something like that and then they're like hey our next big move we're gonna sell this gas we're gonna sell this laughing gas the people at the circus you say that you say oh how could that be a, such a big deal but it's apparently a big enough deal that the, it immediately puts them in violent confrontation with a one percent uh, motorcycle gang who is uh, also way, selling nitrous at festivals the name of the bad biker gang in this show is literally black adam i mean oh it's, it's, it's black mcadam is the name black mcadam is the name of the one percenter motorcycle gang that he runs afoul of but every time mm-hmm. i just think of black adam is the name of with the bad guys on this show. Uh, so I I like the idea, just rewinding a little bit to the money laundering. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess there could be jurisdictional fights over legal marijuana, um, typically not under a Democratic president. But, I mean, whether it's fully legal or fully illegal, that is, Sylvester Stallone is the last guy I would want setting up my money laundering operation. Does that seem like it would have been his specialty in the mob? <laughs> one of the uh, one of the things in the early episodes that's a recurring plot is him trying to get a fucking debit card. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> there are multiple scenes of his trying to get some sort of credit or debit card and failing. Like, yeah, yeah. His money laundering thing, his money laundering scheme for this business is like, yeah, clearing like a hundred K a week in net income would be what? He's gonna be like, oh, uh, we're selling CDs. All these kids <laughs> love listening to music. We're selling a hundred grand worth of CDs every week. <laughs> I got these old Rosemary Clooney records. We're going to launder money through them. <laughs> <laughs> another, another, another great part about the scene where he first um, begins extorting the marijuana dispensary is Martin Starr's employees include a white guy with dreads who's like, whoa, whoa, man, you're freaking me out. And then like a really high uh, white girl, probably also with dreads and like a nose piercing, who's like, when he accosts them, she's like, like I, I'm, I'm really triggered right now. And he's like, "Well, t- what's trigger? What's, what's trigger? What's that?" Oh yeah, there's so much good, good, good oh, so good uh, uh, <laughs> so much good millennial stuff on this show. Yeah, Sylvester Stallone. In case you were worried that he just lets wokeism happen around him, he does not. Oh yeah, uh-uh. no, no, he does not. <laughs> not on Dwight, the General Man Freddy's watch. I'll tell you that, dude. Dwight, Dwight, the General uh, Man Freddy. Um. Fire Christopher Rufo, who bricked the midterms. He sucks. <laughs> Hire Dwight the General Man <laughs> Freddy. He killed it. Dude, okay. he, what do you hear about jump pronouns? Ahead. I want to jump ahead to... <laughs> I want to jump ahead to the scene in episode two that involves him and Martin Starr going to see like the people who grow all the weed that Martin Starr sells. It's like on an Indian reservation. It's like they have like, and you know, he, he uses his mafia business genius skills to like negotiate a better deal that this guy probably didn't even need to begin with, but because they're on a weed farm, he's eating like, you know, uh, apricot preserves or something. And the guy, like the head dude in charge of it is like, just so you know, those are infused raspberry preserves or whatever. And it's like, infused with what? And he's like, well, you're on a marijuana farm. So, like, he's just been dosing himself with weed. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, I wonder why I feel so good right now. <laughs> and then he's like, <clears throat> they're in the car driving back. And he's like, it's Sly smoking a joint, which, like, honestly, I really appreciate it. Because, like, I always think of Stallone as such a, you know, kind of, like, throwback old school guy. You know, he's like some, something of a reactionary. So it was good to see a Stallone character, you know, just chill out and smoke a dupe. But of course, he gets high and the bullshit he starts talking about is like, I got to ask you a question. 
like what's what's going on in this country right now? Like your generation, like what's going on with all these pronouns? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Rip Van Winkle. You wake up after 25 years, GM has gone electric, Dylan's gone public, a phone, there's a camera, come on, and these pronouns, what the fuck is with the pronouns? He, she, him, they, the, boom, bang, ba, bang, cool, you know what my pronoun is? Guess, uh, time's up, okay. it, as in it, can't take this shit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that amazing, amazing. That's probably my favorite scene on television that I've seen this entire year of watching TV. I would say in my lifetime. Well, I, I love this scene <laughs> for so many reasons. Um, primarily among them that he like just names like no, like pronouns that everyone has always said. Like he, yeah. he, he what the, the fuck he, is like he, him and her. What the hell's a he? It's like, it's like he, what the fuck's a yeah, he? It's like he's not even mad at the concept of like neo pronouns or like stating your pronouns. He's just mad at like the idea of using pronouns of referring to yourself, yeah, like that article of speech. Yeah, it's pissing yeah, him off. Unless you're referring to yourself or others by their proper noun, by their full name at all times. Don't talk about them. Also, also no, I, I feel like that, that his his pro like cons- that's a classic conservative joke. Like, yo, my pronouns are let's go Brandon or whatever. But like my pronoun is it. I can't take this shit. <laughs> that's, that's, Just boggles the mind. It's so good. He's it's awesome. So good. He's like, call me, call me it now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sylvester Stallone is uh he's 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 it okay <laughs> we should respect that but I feel like going back to something you said I I totally agree with you Christopher Rufo lives of TikTok huge fucking losers Brick. get get the white man Freedy get Frank Stallone instead of Sly get Frank and Sly Stallone put them in charge of Republican messaging they'll sort out these gender youths and the teachers they would not have like lost the Senate. That that would not have happened to him. Christopher Rufo is a loser. Lives of TikTok loser. If you stuck either of them in Oklahoma, they would not. They're definitely not becoming the kings or queens of Tulsa. I'll tell you that much. Not in the least. No way. Maybe maybe the, maybe the Tulsa jester. That's the most they can hope for. <laughs> <laughs> uh and then uh, going back to the first episode, he then meets like it's just sort of like he he slowly but surely puts together his own ragtag crew out in Tulsa of, you know, people that you wouldn't think would be involved in a mafia enterprise. But you know what? He makes it work. They're sort of like the gang that couldn't shoot straight a little bit, a little bit, a little bit outside. That's he's coloring a little bit outside the lines. Uh, <laughs> well, for a mafia guy, eh, then he's like employing a black guy at all. <laughs> Let alone yeah. trusting him with uh, business or anything like that. So, like the the fourth member of the crew that he meets is a bartender at a cowboy bar played by uh, Garrett Headland, who you may remember from Inside Lewin Davis. He's a uh, sort of John Goodman's chaperone. He also played Neil Cassidy in the On the Road movie. He's he was, sort of a, like, he he, was a failed hunk. He was he's one yeah. of the many attempts <laughs> he's to one do of the a younger hunks. movie star that failed because we don't that the the. the the conditions are no longer applicable. So he had to end up going back to TV. Yeah. The economics for you know, hunks uh, post Bush administration really are tough. Yeah. But you know, good, good to see Garrett in a TV show. Um, but you know, he's an ex con too. He's done some time and you know, he, he <laughs> I tell you like the name of the bar that he runs is called bread to buck. He runs the buck breaking bar. <laughs> he's, like, he's a professional buck breaking. <laughs> all, the, all the barbacks have to just find new skirts to put black guys in. <laughs> but uh, at the bread to buck bar, uh, at, the, at the breeding club, uh, he beats the love interest to the show. Now, Felix, I'm interested to see if you clock this. Do you recognize the Sly Stallone love interest from another TV show that I know you're a fan of? Wait, no. Wait, who is she? Okay. Who is she? She was a character on Veep. She was not in the main cast. She was a recurring character. She was Selena's college friend who comes in to consult for them but never does anything. Oh, my God. She just the ends one up who just rephrases. everything they say. Yeah. yeah. She just rephrases everything they say back to them. A very funny character. And I really like seeing her on this show as well. But I was like. She's awesome. I was like, where have I seen this woman before? But, yeah, no, she was on Veep. That was her other big TV credit uh, before Tulsa King. Yeah, she is. the. Re- I don't think that's her, though. If you're talking about the, the ATF agent. 
she was on Veep, but she was the Republican vice president who becomes president after the 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 botched election. Oh, okay. Well, the okay. the, the, the fake I'm, I'm Latina gonna... is she the fake? Yeah, the fake Latina. She's the fake right. Latina. Hold on. All right, now I need to look this up. All right. Yeah, Andrea Savage. She plays Laura Montez. Yeah. All right, I was wrong. I, I was wrong. That is Laura Montez. Good call. Yeah. She's okay. the Republican gov- uh, vice president. Well, that was a funny character, too. Yeah. Not as funny as the other one that I thought we don't, she was. Yeah. <laughs> Probably because I like that character so much. And I'm just, I'm rooting for all my VP heads, and I'm rooting for everyone on Tulsa King now. So uh, he encounters her, uh, who's there for her friend's bachelorette party, and like one of the drunk bitches he's with sidles up to Dwight, and he's like, are you famous? <laughs> I he's love like, this scene. If you, lady, lady, if you got to ask if someone's famous, they're not famous. And then she's like, uh, can I take a picture? Can I take a selfie with you? And she's like, listen, don't take this the wrong way, but I don't like having my photograph taken. I love So he's like, scene. once again, combat- combating millennial culture. And then uh, the love interest comes over and she's like, hey, why are you mean to my friend? And she's like, well, you know, you, you, uh, if you'd been a little nicer, we would have invited you to the party. And he's like, party? This don't seem like a party. And then she's like, okay, what's your idea of a party? And then the next scene is that he's taken the bachelorette party to a strip club. And he's showing these gals a good old school time. That's what, lady, that's what all ladies want to do is go to a CD strip club in Tulsa for their bachelorette with party. A with a 75-year-old man. Gen- <laughs> so well, here's the funny part. He then takes her home and they have sex. And then the woman is horrified to find out that he's 75 years old. And I was like, lady. Unrealistic. Uh, do you have eyes? <laughs> yeah. That is the most, I'm sorry. That is the most unreal. That is the most unrealistic thing in this entire show. I could buy anything else except for like a millennial or younger woman being like, ew, a 75 year old. That is the opposite. <laughs> that is the opposite of reality. <laughs> like if you, if you, uh, All yeah. women eventually marry their grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> if you want, like, you know what, you know what makes uh, you know, any woman horny fellas out there? Our listeners are, you know, they're millennials. They're, they're creeping up there. They, they, you've long past 30. It's, uh, it's time for you to uh, learn a few tricks of the trade. Tell that girl you're casually seeing that you're experiencing hip problems. Really play <laughs> off the angle. <laughs> <laughs> girls around 25 love it when a man is old and i guarantee you if he had told her in real life if that really happened the equivalent of that situation he says oh, i'm 75 she would have squirted with such a force that would it would have destroyed the hotel hey uh dwight the general manfredi would have been like the normandy landing all over again how wet she was getting <laughs> yes uh, so she's horrified to find out that the guy she just fucked was a high school senior when Kennedy was assassinated. <laughs> but uh, that, but that's all, not not all is done with this character because the next day we find out that as Matt already alluded to she's an ATF agent. Oh, and then in like in, in her morning meeting they're like, hey guys, uh, just something to be on the lookout for. FBI has uh, just uh, tapped our shoulder and let us know that a well known mafia associate has just come into town. And so if any of you have had sex with him in the last 24 hours, <laughs> now is the time to say so. Yeah. They're sitting so around. They're like, sitting. Oh, fuck me. Yeah. They're sitting around the office Keurig and they're like, so has anyone like fucked any criminals by mistake recently? Um, so like, yeah, basically that's that's the end of episode one. Now, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to uh, now spend like the rest of just talk about some highlights from uh, we, we've, we've done the good guys. Good job setting up the pilot and the concept of the show. But. You know the the show's still ongoing. It's in its sixth episode, but uh, what are some what are some other highlights from the the next couple episodes? Because there's a I already alluded to, to the pronoun conversation in episode two, which, like I said, is probably the funnest moment I've had watching television all year. Um, but th- there's a point uh, I one of the get favorites for me is so yeah. Dwight decides hey we're gonna make some money selling nitrous to these kids at this music festival where they run afoul of the. 1% bikers who are already there. Uh, and their leader is, of course, a scary uh, Northern Irish guy because that's that uh, Kurt Sutter DNA infused in here that you can't get out. Yeah. Uh, and then they, those, uh, the bikers, of course, end up beating the hell out of his, his soft <laughs> of Martin millennial Star. Uh, yeah. uh, minions. Or Martin Star. Uh, and then they go to M- Dwight and they're like, what do we do? Oh my God. Like this guy's. And he's like, you guys ever read Sun Tzu's Art of War? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes, we, yes. We don't, you don't got to fight sometimes. You just, you do strategy. You got to think. <laughs> and then 
the plan that he comes up with is they just go to where the bikers are, get a bunch of baseball bats and just beat them up. Yeah, that which that, they that, handily do. They successfully beat the shit out of a larger number of motorcycle uh, uh, criminals it led by 75 year old Sylvester Sloan, who, of course, knocks everybody the fuck out. And when he says he says so, they're like, uh, so like they're they're, uh, cause they're they're at the fairgrounds. And then like Martin Starr or whatever is just like, OK, what does Sun Tzu say we should do now? And then Stallone goes in the Ottawa, Sun Tzu says. At some point in his life, every man's got to grow a set of balls. And then he just pops up <laughs> in the trunk, and there's like 15 baseball bats in there. So I was like, what happened to the greatest victories are achieved without violence? And it's like, okay, sometimes the greatest victories are achieved without violence. Other times they are achieved with violence, though. So that's what we're doing now. <laughs> so, but okay, Matt, the, the other... Okay, what, the whole Sun Tzu narrative made me think of Brian Quimby so much because this was like a perfect like Brian Quimby like I, I just felt like this was so much in his wheelhouse I told him to watch this show but like explicitly like the perfect dumb guy thing of referencing the art of war and then doing the exact opposite of what that quote is supposed to import <laughs> then no, no, there's one more element to the, the, rum, the nitrous oxide baseball bat art of war rumble that I thought really that we really must comment on it's that he employs his chauffeur's dad to come along and, and, and do an act of gang violence with his son to sort of reunite them. Because, like, the dad is worried that, like, son, you're better than this. You need to go back to college. You don't need to be working for this criminal. And he's like, dad, I'm my own man. I can do what I want. And then Stallone just sort of meets the dad and is like, hey, you want to come beat up some bikers with us? And he's like, all right, I'll help my son. <laughs> so it's Look, like, my son's going to go out beating bikers. I want to go out and beat up bikers with him. You know, it's like how you want to you want your kids to drink in your house so they don't get into trouble. Yeah, they really um, that was a conflict. They pretty quickly scrapped um, my uh, one of my highlights. It's a it's a darker scene, but uh, or set of scenes. But it it, it it is so insane that I still want to mention it. So obviously, like every single character. Of, of his type every character like this where it's like a, a wizened old tough guy he has a daughter who doesn't like him every character like that has yep. one of those right yep sylvester sloan's character obviously he's got one of those so there's this revelation that she was raped by like one of his associates but the way that they like reveal this is so insane oh they, my they, god they, yeah they, <laughs> Basically, she's like, um, you know, you don't, you, you don't give a shit. You're never around, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he goes, oh, I don't know. what are you talking about? And she's like, well, like, well, one of your associates, he did something. Never mind. And he goes, what did one of my associates do to you? <laughs> and, he, and she goes, let's just say he showed me why they call him the package. Which is oh. like, it's like <laughs> dialogue. It's like dialogue from a, a, a fucking porno used to describe this character's rape. It's insane. Just out of this world. I, I don't know how that made it in. But this is like, I, I mean, it's hard to pick a favorite moment, though. This is just, this is really the successor to Sons of Anarchy more than any, more than even the Mayans, which I love. Okay. Taylor Sheridan, if you're listening to the show, if, if people are connected to the Taylor Sheridan verse, what would it take? Okay, you already said Tulsa King season two already been greenlit. It's a big hit. What would it take to incorporate Kurt Sutter as an actor onto Tulsa King? What oh would it God. take oh, for him baby. to reprise his Armenian hitman <laughs> character from The Shield, but he's in Tulsa? And also for Kurt Sutter to do his uh, director's trademark of having a limb cut off, being given AIDS, uh, being given hepatitis, <laughs> losing an eye, having his tongue oh, no, no, no. cut out, yeah. uh, being cuckolded, uh, <laughs> being like having an Amazon Alexa shoved up his ass and uh, having the Alexa <laughs> recite all the most traumatic memories of his life. Uh, just all these things. That like maybe, maybe, There's so many maybe. things that he could do. Like he could, they could have him get fed into an industrial meat pr meat grinder or something. Yeah, maybe Let's Dwight could like uh, reminisce about his time in jail, and Kurt Sutter could reply like, in flashbacks, reprise the role of Otto from Sons of Anarchy, like you said. And Dwight could just be like, "I'm gonna throw you something, Bodie." He'll be talking like Martin Starr, one of the millennials. 
You think you got a rough today with all these pronouns and going to work? <laughs> Let me tell you about the most raped man I've ever met. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell you about the most yeah. tortured rape man I've ever met. <laughs> yeah, he go. Yeah, he goes up to the black guy and he's like, "Who's the most raped guy you know?" And he's like, "What? I don't know anyone like that." He's like, "Well, that's right, because you never met anyone who got raped as many as my friend Otto. You know why he got <laughs> raped?" Because he believed in something. Because <laughs> he had honor. <laughs> that yeah, I would love to see Kurt Sutter in it. Um, I but for the, I mean, mostly though, I really do just trust Taylor Sheridan's instincts. Like he he is he is keyed in to the uh, the sort of uh, for the people in the audience who have played the game Deus Ex when you link into cybernetic human consciousness. Uh, Taylor Sheridan is that, but with the uh, cybernetic unit consciousness of TV, he understands it in a deep way that I don't think anyone else quite does. Ken Olin gets a little bit because Ken Olin knows so many evil, you know, heartstring tugging tricks. But Taylor Sheridan, I have to say he's using his powers for good. You can tell that with the, the daughter subplot. So. She admits this, uh, that she'd been assaulted by one of his associates when he was in prison. And she says, don't do anything about it. You know, I've, I've, I've gone, I've moved on and all that. And of course, an opportunity for Dwight to show some growth and like respect his daughter's wishes. Uh, no, he immediately goes, <laughs> finds the guy and beats him to death in yes. front of all the other mafia guys. And then he stomps he his face open. And then he immediately goes directly from doing a, a murder right back to his daughter probably 15 minutes after they had this conversation and she's yep. like dad did you murder the guy who raped me and he's like yeah i did what do you want from me he's like, i told you not to though he's he's got blood dripping off of his fucking hands from beating this guy to death and he's like i he's didn't like, do i did it for you that's what i did it for the honor that's why taylor sheridan is such a fucking genius though because like the 48 year olds who are watching this and there are millions of them this is like yeah. This is the big. This is going to be the biggest <laughs> show on TV. That is like they get to watch that scene, and it replaces the real reason in their brains why their daughters don't talk to them. Like they see that, and they're like, they're like, oh, no, oh, that's actually what happened. Like, oh, I, I actually did that, and that's like why she didn't come home for Christmas, not because of like something insane <laughs> I said or did. But it's, I just like love her. Yeah, not much. because of what I the fucking the the genocidal. Uh, minions memes i keep posting on facebook <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah not because i told her that like taylor swift got executed and gitmo for being a pedophile <laughs> i gotta ask you guys literally your generation this country honestly what the fuck is going on with all these minions <laughs> everywhere i look there's a fucking minion everywhere so uh, some other uh, some other good like sort of uh um uh millennial uh lindy versus new uh culture clash is him discovering like uh coffee shops Ooh. And then he's like, "Hey, can I can I just get can I just get this espresso in like a cup, like a not like a normal cup?" <laughs> and like you know, the 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 blue hair behind the counter is just like, "I think it's really cool that you're gr that you're green, but like we only use recycled paper here, you know. But if you want to bring your own metal cup, that's fine." And, he's just, and then and then he brings his own espresso cup to like a Starbucks and pours the espresso in a little a little porcelain espresso. Have, a, have his little have his little cafe. That that is. What's so great about this show is like they do like they do a bunch of stuff that's like well tread, right? Where like an older, like badass character rages against the modern. Like, you know, since for, we've been seeing the coffee trope for over 30 years now. I mean, we, we famously yeah. referenced the I want some coffee flavored coffee. OK, exactly. We, we've referenced the all time great Dennis Leary bit that was literally <laughs> from over 30 years ago. But there's just like a, a, a certain panache that uh, Sheridan and Stallone bring to it. It makes it feel new. They, they really take a bunch of angles that no one else would take. And the fact that it's it's not Dennis Leary or it's not like, I don't know, Clint, that it is this, um, I would say, probably the most confusing physiology a 75-year-old has ever had <laughs> really just adds so much to it. Just a terrific show. I mean, look, I'm sure I'm sure a few uh, an unfortunate few thousand of you uh, 
have the grave dishonor of having to go home to the holiday, go home for the holidays to Missouri or one of those places. Well, why don't you watch this show with your parents? They may have their values, but you will still love it. It's a little family bonding. Uh, fun for the whole family. Yes. Uh, yeah. one, more, one more scene and character that I'd like to bring up is that uh, one of the guys that he adds to his crew is like uh, a former New York mob guy who's like hiding, been hiding out in Oklahoma for like 20 or 30 years, like about the same amount of time since Dwight's been gone. He's like, he's lit out and he's like, not witness protection, but he just like fled the mafia and is now working on like a, a, a horse farm in Oklahoma for some rich lady <laughs> uh, played by uh, Max Casella, who was also in Inside Lewin Davis. And he was also on The Sopranos. He's the dude that Artie Bucco beats up, who's like fucking his hostess or whatever. He was one of Tony's Benny flunkies Fazio. on The Sopranos. Yeah, yeah. And he's on this show and like he sees Stallone in a mall and immediately thinks that like he's been sent to Oklahoma to kill him, right? To assassinate him for, you know, breaking his, breaking Omuerta and leaving this thing of ours. And then there's a hilarious scene where he takes it upon himself to strike first and attempts to kill Sylvester Stallone while he's taking his driver's ed exam and nearly domes the driver's ed teacher leading to like a fucking car chase where like the his driver's ed instructor is like in the passenger seat the whole time. I think I'm dying. You're not dying. If you were dying, you'd already be dead. That was, The driver's ed scene is great. And, uh, you know, frankly, as a... Uh, Someone who will one day be taking driver's head again gave me a lot of confidence. <laughs> yeah. When I, no, when yeah, I, exactly. Yeah. Like, keep your, keep, keep your cool, check your mirrors and, you know, don't get shot in the head. But, you know, so yeah. like, basically he, uh, despite the fact that this guy uh, nearly murdered him, he's sort of, he's just like, Hey, you work for me now. And then he's part of the crew and you know what? He loves it. He's having fun again. He's, he's fighting bikers, hitting them with baseball bats. He beats up the guy whose dog keeps shitting on his lawn. It's like, you know, he, he, he's, he's forgotten what it's like to be Lindy. And now that Stallone's in town, he can be, he can be in an organized, he can be in a gang again. And that's what this show's about. It's like, you know, in this modern world, in, in, in this world, that's, uh, you know, lost lost sight of things like honor and tradition. People have lost sight of being in gangs. Yeah, I mean, that's what the, that social atomization does. You get rid of gangs, bowling leagues, all this stuff. So, like, this is you know, we've been we've been making fun of this show that like it's a, that this show is an, a, an assault on you know the woke mind virus and millennial culture. But really, what it is, it's about chosen family. It's about the gang that you choose rather than the one you're born into. Yeah, no, and I don't think I really don't think so much that it's like an attack on millennial culture, because like what I see the show as at the end of the day is that like, OK, there's this tragedy that there, there really like isn't a mafia in America anymore. We've talked about it a bunch, how sad it is, mm -hmm. how good it would be for there to be a mafia, how many activities they would provide for people, how it was just nice to have them around, you know? But um, it shows that even if you are a millennial, even if you are clinically libtarded, as as you know, I am, as you are, as we all are, you can still start your own mafia in Tulsa. You need it. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, there's still there's a frontier out there. There's places where they don't know nothing about protection rackets and you can just walk in and get some clueless guy to just give you money out of his safe. Yeah. And, and, and the, the young millennials. Sure. They could not start their own mafia. But at the same time, the experienced copper regime, Dw Dwight Manfredi, he could not have his own mafia just as an island. He needs them. We need community. We need to work yeah. together. The old and the young, we can both learn from each other. And together, we can recreate the fun of the old mafia, even with pronouns, e even, even, even with cell phones, even with girls wearing jeans. It's like, look, Stallone, Dwight Manfredi, he needs to be taught about things like Uber and having a driver's license and paying taxes. <laughs> but then, like, you know, Martin Starr and, like, the chauffeur character, they need to be taught about things like, yeah, um, doing murders on the orders of Olden Wren, um, running protection rackets, um, do, doing racketeering, you know, just classic stuff like that that they don't teach anymore because they're, <laughs> they're teaching the 1619 Project in schools and not how to run uh, a book, how to take that out, what, what, what a spread is and how to... <laughs> how to get money out of uh, degenerate gamblers. Tulsa is in your hearts if you want it. That's, yes. that's the message of this show. Yeah. Look, I know I say it all the time, but TV is back. And boy, howdy, did it never go away. 
Uh, I think I think you know. I think Tulsa Kings, but it's about halfway through this season. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll, I think we'll have to come back for the you know like a, a season wrap up. Maybe we have some have some guests, you know, because you know this show it's it's giving me that Sons of Anarchy magic. It's giving me that feeling for a bad TV is good TV. Good TV is bad. Good the TV best, is yeah. bad. I like like look, man. I I fucking love like actually good TV. I know we make fun of prestige TV. The White Lotus. I fucking I think it's amazing. I love it. I, I've I've endlessly sung its praises. Mad Men, love it. Sopranos. You, you you've heard me say everything about it. But also, this type of TV needs to exist too, and it's great in its own way. And also, this is my final plea, Taylor Sheridan. Please hire all three of us. We would do nothing but yes, add to your yes. vision. If that you would. Had, oh my god! We you know, want we to know the millennial uh, scumbags that you're trying yeah, to own. Yeah, we can if make you want, the, if you, the owning if you need, of them if you need a even richer, richer, more punch textured. Up the Martin Star character. We just get our numbers, please. Yeah. I oh God, I I cannot think of a more fun job than like writing for Tulsa oh, yeah. King. We would be so good at it too. You know the um you know the fake prestige show that I that I made up, The Frozen Garden? <laughs> no, what's that? <laughs> just, I, I was like just trying to come up with like a fake like a fake like sort of sub prestige show that would be on AMC, like something that they would try where they're trying to like recapture the breaking bad magic, but it's like not as good of a cast or writers. And it's called the frozen garden. And it's about a detective who hurt his knee while playing like college hockey. So he had to become a detective and he has to solve his stepdaughter's <laughs> murder. <laughs> and he has a pill problem. <laughs> Taylor Sheridan, please right. let us write the frozen garden. All right. Here's, here's my, here's my writing packet. I'm going to submit this to uh, Taylor Sheridan right now. A potential future plot line on Tulsa King. Okay, like how do we how do we deal with Dwight in this modern world of apps and things like that and opportunities for crime there within? So he discovers the app Grinder, the gay hookup <laughs> app, and he gets on the gay hookup app and arranges dates with gay men. And when they show up expecting some dick from you know a seventy five year old daddy with big muscles. <laughs> He then extorts them for being gay, even though it's totally normal and okay to be gay. So he shows up for the date and like maybe uh, he has sex with them, but then takes photos and he's like, hey, you want your wife finding out about this? And he's like, uh, dude, I'm, I'm gay. And I'm not, I'm not mad. And he's like, okay, how about your job? And like, they're like, yeah, I, I own my own business. This is, it's an okay. You don't have to be, you have to be blackmailed by this. But then of course, all of them will end up being blackmailed by him anyway, because they'll just give over money. Cause <laughs> yeah. They don't know what to do. They don't, they don't know how to handle a guy like him. He, so he okay. starts extorting openly gay men for being gay. Ooh, okay, that's that's. <laughs> it makes as much sense as as uh, doing a protection racket on a legal business uh, with no like organized crime anywhere around to threaten them. Okay, how about this? Um, on seven, so Martin Starr he goes to see an unnamed uh, live podcast show. Um, I'm not writing in cameos <laughs> for ourselves, but if. Mr. Sheridan, you see that fit? Uh, we would be honored. And uh, so he, he goes there. There's a DSA table, and he sees a cute girl. <laughs> she's got a uh, she's got a Monroe piercing because it's Tulsa, and they still think that's cool there. Uh, and he's like, ah, I just uh, I really want her, but I don't know what to do. And uh, Dwight is there, obviously. He's not paying attention to all that. He notices like all the different types of pride flags, right? And he's like, wait a minute, I got an idea. And his new racket that his ragtag gang comes up with is that they're going to make pride flags with increasingly made up stripes to represent things that like aren't on other pride flags. And if you don't, oh, if so you don't, have, you the, don't have the new flags with stripes yeah. on it, then they can extort you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you like he'll he, oh oh like your flag doesn't have people who are in federal prison for rico charges you're <laughs> you're not a real ally like that i think that would be a great storyline we could introduce the dsa girl as a character but then have it so that the dsa girl is actually a mafia mole sent to spy on dwight ah but then she really falls in love with martin star I couldn't help but like, noticing that your pride flag doesn't represent arrow ace peoples, and it would just be a shame if something <laughs> happened to you. It would be, be a shame if you were excluding asexual people from pride. You do a lot of thinking when you're in the can. About 10 years in, I realized I'm pan. 
Or no, he would, he would, he would, he would, he would say, he would say something like, "I realize that pan ain't just something that you put your mozzarella in." <laughs> oh God! Okay, this this writes itself. Okay, uh, please hire us. Yeah, no, no. Okay, so no, he discovers that Martin Starr is in a poly relationship, and he'll be like. What the fuck? Back in my day, I used to just, I used to just, I used to just give my guma to the old, the old brajol on a Saturday. Oh my god! Yeah, then he real, then they realize that like the guma, so the open guma system is really just poly. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, and it's just like you know a beautiful linking of uh, past and present. Man, you know, maybe you know, this uh, <laughs> makes more sense. I didn't know. You know. <laughs> I've been in a poly relationship this whole time. Oh. Uh, you know, at the Copa, Saturdays were for your primary partners, but Fridays are always for the thirds and unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got this secret document. It's a list of all the shittiest men in Tulsa media. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, this, 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 this show writes itself. God damn it. Oh, uh, uh, so we, many good stuff. So, uh, please hire us. There we go. That's uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's Lindy King. That's that's our <laughs> uh, su- our submission to Taylor Sheridan to hire the three of us as actors, writers, showrunners. You know, like I can do it all, Taylor. Yeah. I can do it all, and uh, you know, like I said, I could I can punch up any character who's um a gay, cringe, and libtarded. Yeah, no, we're all writing from personal experience here. <laughs> um, and, and and like we would love to write for this show, but we will like write for any show you create. We'll even create one for you, and you can just say you did it. We don't care. We just want to be involved. Let's link and build. Let's link yeah. and build. We think you're awesome. We're so glad that you've dethroned the villain Ken Olin to become the new king of TV. You rock, sir. So there you go. That's uh, that's Tulsa King. Um, I promise Avatar is coming soon. Yeah, we will do that. We will. Once I test negative for gay, we'll do it. (laughs) Hello, everybody. It's Thursday, October 10th, and we've got some chop up coming at you today. Uh, On today's episode, as promised on a previous one, we take a uh, a break from the dreary world of uh, war and electoral politics in this country to go back to, to, I think, you know, our our original mission statement, our original purpose, dumb guy television, dumb guy television. That's right, folks. We are back and we're talking about my king, your king, the king of the world, the Tulsa king starring Sylvester Stallone, a jewel in the Taylor Sheridan TV universe. Felix... Just to update our audience, where we left, left our Tulsa King, where were they and what were they up to? Just so people remember, the titular Tulsa King is Dwight the General Manfredi. He is a 76-year-old, like a uh, former mafia cap, or it's sort of indeterminate. He's like in quasi-retirement, <laughs> but he is, he's just he's just done like 30 years in prison. Uh, he gets out and he, he goes to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he um, starts a shockingly like multiracial crime group. That's uh, you know, that is really one of the things about Tulsa King. Just imagine a real life Columbo captain going to prison in like 1980, 86 or 87. Would they be as woke as Dwight the general? I don't know. I don't hey. know. Frankly, I don't want to know. I like Dwight. They, you know, they said they killed Joey Gallo because he worked with black people inside prison. So, you know, like Dwight says on the show, he did a lot of reading in prison. He and did, one those, yes. <laughs> one of those books was White Fragility. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, he he did a lot of reading in prison. He gets out. It's a whole new world, right? So, you know, what it, what is a mafia captain going to get into? They get into legal weed, um, protection, like more traditional mafia rackets. Somewhere along the way, he fucks an ATF agent. Mm -hmm. that is one thing about Dwight just like you may look at him and be like this is a 76 year old 5'2 man with severe brain damage there's no way he comes out (laughs) on top of all these situations but you would be wrong you would be wrong any woman he sees he's fucking them any danger he's in he's overcoming it if he's at a federal trial you know which we'll get to later be people go oh federal cases like 98 percent conviction uh you just wait till <laughs> dwight the general <laughs> becomes his own attorney okay uh, if this uh, the state's attorney for oklahoma probably thought this was a layup uh putting dwight back in prison for trying to bribe a federal official but he didn't count on a 80 year old italian man with brain damage defending himself 
Yeah. High price lawyers, they're just gonna send you back to the big house. But Dwight, he's sort of uh he's sort of a different character. He does things well, a little you, bit differently. Yeah, like defense attorneys, it's like pharmaceutical companies. They want you to lose your case so you can pay for more appeals, just like how they won't cure cancer if they're a <laughs> pharmaceutical company. Che- you know, cheaper to get it done yourself. So we're, we're on the set. We recapped the first season. We fell in love with the show. But there is something I've noticed in this second season that I don't, I don't, I, I, I really didn't notice as much in the first. And I was wondering if you noticed that there is in the same way that the the movie Cobra has this like dream like quality because everyone talks to each other like they're fucking space aliens like ever yeah. that everyone is so disjointed one thing doesn't really lead to the other you know even by the standards of like bad movies um there's a little bit of that in season 1 though it's more standard Taylor Sheridan fare the second season I re- it really feels like a fever dream that like a typical scene, like a typical scene is like they're going somewhere like Dwight and, you know, Martin Starr and the, and his multiracial crew of semi criminals. And it's like, you know, the, the patter that's in these types of shows and they'll be like, you know, someone will be listening to, uh, they'll be on their AirPods and Dwight's like trying to talk to them. And one of the characters will go, he's on He's listening to music. And Dwight goes, what are you listening to? And uh, the Martin Starr character goes fish, and he's like, "You can't listen to a fish." <laughs> you pull uh, my, you're yanking my chain. Put, one time I put a carp to my ear. I couldn't hear nothing. I just felt wet. <laughs> yeah, if somebody was like that, like that in real life, you'd be like, "Oh my god, we have to get you. We have to put you in the care of the state." <laughs> like, uh, you're, yeah. you're a medical moron. <laughs> you're, yeah, he looks. Like, I definitely picked up on this quality you're talking about on this season. And, you know, I, I, I got to be a little bit critical off the top of the show. You know, we are, re- we are recapping and reviewing the first four episodes of season two of Tulsa King. And I kind of feel like they've lost a little bit of momentum from the first season. The first four episodes of the second season just seem like recap. They, they literally just seems like the first four episodes of the first season. Not much has changed, but you're right. The dialogue has this very dreamlike quality to it. I just got here. What does that mean? Is there a problem? There wasn't. Until there was. But Turner, what's that supposed to mean? I know where you come from. You're here to take advantage, right? Isn't that what you people do? You people. You come up here pretending you're somebody all attitude all that. Tough guy and shit. Hmm? But out here, people get swallowed up by people that have real push. Ooh. Ooh. By the way you're looking at me, am I supposed to feel threatened? And I'm thinking this, the scene that really sticks out of my head is the scene where Dwight Manfredi, Dwight the General, Sly Stallone, first encounters what is sure to be this season's uh, new adversary, played by Neil McDonough, who you might remember from such TV shows as Justified and Chapo, all-time favorite, Band of Brothers. He's the sort of the scary, the sort of icy blonde looking guy who plays a Oklahoma weed and a weed and petroleum magnate. And I, I like the idea that like he he owns all the oil fields in Oklahoma, but also he's the biggest weed dealer. You know, you got to diversify. You th- yeah, <laughs> you think yeah. if you made your fortune in petroleum, you wouldn't need to branch out into legal weed. But that's neither here nor there. When Dwight faces off with his this season's primary antagonist, their first interaction goes something like this: uh, Neil McDonough, I see you've come a long way from Brooklyn. Sliced alone. Yeah, but I like it in Oklahoma here. Uh, Neil McDonough, you should be careful because sometimes the winds blow in strange directions out here on the plains. Sliced alone. Is that a threat? Neil McDonough, do you feel threatened? Sliced alone. Uh, way, the way when I was in the joint and someone threatened me, I would walk away like I'm going to do now. It's just, it's this weird, it's just a strange quality to the dialogue on this season. Yeah, it's almost like, how would I just, I would describe it like it's not like the characters are 
standing in front of each other or next to each other and exchanging words in real time, it's almost like they're sending notes to each other, but reading them out loud. <laughs> like there, 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 there is this like there's this like um disconnected quote like uh, disconnected um reaction between what one person says to another that is very. I mean, we said dreamlike, and that's really it. You know how, like, y- you don't actually hear anything in a dream. Like, that's one of the weird yeah. things about it. But your your brain sort of fills in the blanks, and we you see someone's lips moving, or you see someone someone respond in a certain emotional way. Your brain sort of like um, paves over that and goes, "Oh, he said, you know, that guy said, um, you know, whatever weird thing is happening to in, in your dream, like that you." That you, that guy said that you have to shave your first grade teacher's back, or else you, <laughs> you you have to you have to do college again. You know the stuff that happens. In yeah, dreams. it's like you have you have a feeling of what what the the context of the dream is that's causing the anxiety. But like, yeah, like you know, people are speaking to you in the dream, but it doesn't register in the dream. But you know what they're saying, but they're not saying it. And that's exactly. and that's what the dialogue feels like. Like, for instance, in the scene where uh, Sly Stallone, representing himself in a federal bribery case, uh, gets an appointment with the Oklahoma state's attorney and walks in, is like, "I think we could just settle this out of court. I do a little community service, but no jail time." And the guy's like, "What the fuck are you talking about? No jail time? <laughs> <laughs> Who, what are you going to, going to the state's attorney like he's fucking Andy Griffith?" The, fed, like, the fucking federal attorney and being like, and he's like what if i what if i paint your garage <laughs> he's like listen i want to be i want to be clear here. i'm guilty of the crime but you know i'm just thinking what if i plead guilty and you give me no jail time and the guy's like no deal but like you know well, but, but it doesn't really go down like that because he's like are you doing this because you want to do it or because someone else is making you do it and the guy looks at him and he's like mr manfredi we all serve different masters and then he just gets up and leaves. He's like, all right, bye. That, that, that is how they get out of how weird the stuff Dwight is saying is that they, they just like 90. It's very French because 90 percent of conversations end with someone storming out. How You know, just the typical way the conversations go inside the Schengen zone. But um, <laughs> my favorite, I, what I loved about that scene, the tete-a-tete with the U.S. attorney is that Dwight goes, it would be kind of a waste of money to have this trial. Like, that's the way that the <laughs> Department of Justice he's like, works. He's like, the federal <laughs> drug government has very deep pockets, Mr. Manfredi. And he's like, I once had a pants where the pockets are too deep. I couldn't find my keys. And then I realized they were by my knees. And then they're like, um, could you leave now? <laughs> <You Yeah. were> <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got an appointment in five minutes. Uh, I don't need to hear your recollections about your the pants you wore one time on the Lower East Side. I love the idea that the Department of Justice is like, do we like how much is it going to cost to um, (laughs) a bribery trial for a 76 year old um, man with the mind of a child uh, who is acting as his own as his own attorney? How much is that going to cost to like uh, prosecute a case against him? I think they can we do it can't, on the we, like we can't like can we just not <laughs> afford to prosecute federal crimes in all of Oklahoma for this month? And he's like, well, let's just do a deal. I do some community service, you know. You you you, you run you you be district attorney, and he's just like, uh, no, you have to go to jail. And he's like, all right, bye. Uh, but but then but then he's acquitted. But then he's the the the, the courtroom plotline on the first four episodes of this season was the most perfunctory thing I've ever seen on a show. Because the season begins and he's in prison. Uh, he's just been arrested. Uh, like the season finale ended of season one ended with him being arrested for bribing the ATF agent that he was having sex with. A plot line I completely forgot about. I have no, I have no idea. So for, it's so I, forget. It's like it's so it's, it is like nothing. It is. It is like the the translucent iceberg lettuce that comes with the worst wings from the most Albanian owned <laughs> <Yeah>. pizza place. <laughs> That is how it's nothing just, that plot is. Yeah. And it's just like, it sets it up in like first couple of episodes because like his daughter is living in Tulsa and she's like, you know, you spent a quarter of my life in prison. I don't want you to go to back to prison. And he's like, oh, you know, maybe, maybe I will. Maybe I won't. I'll see if I can do a deal. And then like, and, and then they have, they have the actual trial and the trial itself takes not even a, like they, they finished the trial before lunch on the first day. 
because both sides are like, yeah, we don't really have any witnesses to call or our closing or opening statements. Dwight just gets his former girlfriend on stand and he's like, would you say that we were two people who shared something? And they're like leading the witness. And he's like, OK, let me rephrase that. Did you and I did you and I share an intimate, classy evening together? And they're like, OK, yeah, and that, like that's that's he gets his girlfriend on the stand and he's like, would you say I bribed you? Or did you just, or did I just want to do something nice for you because we shared a nice classy moment with each other? And, and yeah. even though, even though I'm 80 years old, you still rolled around in the hay with me and you had sex with me again a second time, even when you knew I was 80 years old. So maybe I wanted to do something nice for you, but I did not ask for anything in return. And she's like, yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much how it went down. Not guilty. Did the government have any, pl- like they, did they have- presumably <laughs> knew that, they were like, oh, our star witness had sex with this simple minded 78 year old man. May- Should we do something? <laughs> Should we have any other witnesses? Nah, it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, his entire he cross examines her and it's it's this big scene. But his entire cross examination was like, would you say that I was a generous or selfish lover? <laughs> Did I order Grubhub after? Would you say that we had most generously a June December romance? <laughs> and it totally, it just completely exonerates him. Yeah, not guilty. But it's like that, that that's the problem with it is that it's like at as a view, maybe other viewers of Tulsa King didn't feel this way, but me personally, I was like, there was no chance that anything was good. He wins every situation he's ever in. That's kind of the fun of the show, is that there is absolutely nothing to be nervous about. You know nothing yeah. bad is going to happen to Dwight. He he's he. It doesn't matter how crazy he seems, or how simple minded, or how bad he is at talking to other human beings. There is no situation that he will lose ever. It makes you wonder how he went to prison in the first place. He probably just wanted to get away from his family. <laughs> I, I I should note that. Um... Originally, we were supposed to have uh, Brian Quimby on this episode. We will have him back when Tulsa King wraps, wraps up. Uh, we were supposed to do that show last week, but, you know, Israel exists. So Israel is once again fucking with the world and my life by uh, making it so we can't have Brian on this episode. But, uh, Felix, another thing I really like about this show is, uh, like, the saloon where they all work at, which, which featured a surprise appearance by the recording artist Jelly Roll, Oh my uh, episode, god! Can we talk? The jelly about roll the- scene. The jelly roll scene was fantastic because, look, you've already established Dwight. He loves music, but because he's been in prison for the last eighty years of his life, he was actually Dwight Manfredi was born in prison. <laughs> yeah, he's like <laughs> a bear. You no, know, he's like Casper <laughs> Hauser. That's the only way that this show makes sense is that he was born in prison and paroled went on his seventy fifth birthday and then moved to Oklahoma, a state he'd never been to before, and is like finding out about aspects of human life and culture that he's never experienced before. And he's like, "What? I could just go into a store and buy a coffee? Oh, but oh, it wasn't like this when I was in prison. The only place I've ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was born like, with scum like you. I'm from the gutter, too. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's, he's yeah. a bear. Yeah. So, yeah, like eagle eared listeners will remember from last season that uh, one, one of his various businesses that he starts in Tulsa, in addition to to strong arming his way into Martin Starr's weed business, is also buying into uh, the Garrett Headland's uh, honky tonk bar that he turns into a casino. The Buck Broken Saloon. Folks, it's one of the most <laughs> yeah. iconic locations in television. The Broken Buck Saloon, the place where all uh, all bucks go to get broken. And he's turned it into kind of a snazzy joint. And on his, wait, was it? No, no. Oh my God. This is even better. It wasn't at the Buck Breaking Saloon. It was at Martin Starr's new weed store that opens. And it's a weed store that has robots in it. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like they couldn't quite figure out what to do with fucking Martin Starr's character. No, they have no idea what to do with him. They were like, is he a normal nerd? Is he a weed nerd? And like, you you really see this in his interactions with other characters because he'll say something like they'll clearly the writers of the show are only like 10 years younger than the actual Dwight because all the scenes where Martin Starr like does tech stuff. It's very like you remember in Sons of Anarchy when they would be like, Juice, can you hack into the FBI? Database? <laughs> Juice, can you like, open PDF? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll get on it. I'll get on it, Clay. 
Yeah, Juice, can you hack into every satellite that the U.S. government owns? <laughs> yeah, sure. And then he just like spazzes out on a keyboard. That's what Martin Starr's character is like. He'll be like futzing around on his phone and they'll be like, what are you doing? What are you doing, nerd character? And he'll be like, I just found a way to maximize through cookies that we will start a portal that markets weed to every personality type. And then the characters <laughs> yeah, will just like yeah. burst into laughter and he'll go, what's so funny? And then the scene ends. Yeah. I don't at get it. It's so at one, weird. At, at one point, uh, Martin Starr's character is on the computer and Dwight's like, oh, preparing for uh, Dwight's trial. And he's like, oh, I've, uh, I've downloaded an algorithm that lawyers use to screen jurors. And it's determined that we need uh, middle-aged women on the jury because they'll be sympathetic to a romantic plot line in any federal bribery case. And he's like, oh, that's great. But like, you're right. They don't have no idea what to do with Martin Starr's character because on last season, he was a weed store owner that Sly Stallone sort of strong-armed his way into the weed business and sort of like is protecting him, taking him under his wing, extorting him. I don't know. It's very hard to figure out if Martin Starr hates Sly Stallone or not. He seems to begrudgingly have a respect for the man who's extorting him um, and, and nearly getting him killed a number of times. But what is it? Okay, so what to do? How do we evolve this character on season two? He opens another weed store, a better weed store. That has like cool space age weed technology, including a robotic arm that does something that's not really clear. He's like, oh, you got Terminators at the weed store. Look at that. <laughs> but like, remember, Felix, you remember the scene where, okay, like they have to come into the new weed store and a Sly's like, I need to give everyone a pep talk because I just murdered a made guy, uh, the, like a made guy in the Kansas City mafia. I just murdered him and they're pro and they're probably going to be seeking retaliation against me, my family and everyone who is close to me. So and, and like most of his crew are people who were like working at a uh, working at like a working at a coffee. Bur- they were like baristas a week ago and before getting before getting involved in his rackets. So he's like, oh, you know, uh, things get may get a little tough for the next couple of days, you know. Uh, so you know, just everyone keep your head on a swivel in case anyone assassinates you. Yeah, literally, then, his his entire crew are like DoorDash drivers, a weed store owner, and like just some lady. Like, and he's uh, like, <laughs> he's like, uh, but you know, we may have to fight a battalion sized detachment of wops, and they're like, <laughs> okay. Wow, but I'm always up for some adventure. At that at that point, Martin Starr is like, "This is bullshit. I didn't sign on for this. I'm only a white collar criminal that, that that sells weed and does crypto crimes. I'm not into murder or being murdered." And stalks off into his office. And then Stallone's like driver, the the the, the kid who he meets in the first episode, like the young black guy who's like really like imprinted on him as a father figure, like just sort of is like, "I got this, boss." And he goes back into Martin Starr's office and is like. Come on, man. That's our boss you're talking about. And Martin Starr is like, <laughs> oh, well, he's my business partner, not my boss. And like, I don't really want to get killed by the Kansas City Mafia. And then like, I don't know how that resolves, but the, the driver character walks back out into the main, uh, to the weed store. And then Martin Starr follows him. And then he's like, they're like, are you good? And Martin Starr just nods. So he goes from being like, I'm done with this partnership. I don't want to die to just basically being like, okay, I guess I'm still involved in this partnership and I'm going to risk my life a little further. All it took was that level of convincing. Yeah, it just, like, Martin Starr, is, again, the first season I remember about as well as a dream. Like, I remember the literal things that happen, but, like, the actual characterization and everything like that is hazy. Martin Starr, they made him in the second season so much more, like, Roman in party down yeah another great martin star character like he's a real asshole in the second season in a way he in the first he's just kind of like an, a nerd and he's like he sees dwight almost like a manic pixie dream girl he's like my life here is pretty boring but this this uh, buffoonish elderly man <laughs> who's, who, who has a 400 pound bench press could bring some excitement to my life this is very fun but by the second season, like all his scenes with Dwight are like, it'll, it, you know, he'll be like fucking around on the computer and being like, I need to, you know, optimize the databases. And Dwight will go, databases. I, you, I, we used to watch all your base belong to us in prison. It's a pretty <laughs> funny video. 
and Martin Starr will be like, you buffoon, that's an antiquated meme. <laughs> and then the scene ends. <laughs> He's so mean to Dwight. I really hate, I would not act like that to Dwight. I, I mean, like, come on. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it, sh- it should be stressed that, like, outside a few cast-offs from, like, New York City families, Dwight's entire crew are just, like, teenagers and... <laughs> <laughs> and people people who are just you know uh, millennials who were on their phones a week ago and now he's getting them involved in a mob war and they and really i guess life is so boring in tulsa they all just go along with it they're like yeah this is uh, this is better than shoveling horse shit for a living yeah well, let's let's talk about the jelly roll scene because uh, they have a grand opening for martin Starr's new weed store in downtown tulsa and jelly rolls in town because he's doing a concert at the oklahoma center and, you know, he stops in the store and they uh, and, and Dwight's crew plays a little prank on him because uh, Dwight doesn't know who Jelly Roll is. And they're like, oh, you should go in the recording studio that's also in this weed store and do one verse of one of your famous songs. He like Jelly Roll plays it off like he's just a janitor or something. And Dwight's like, well, it's a pretty good job. You know, I, I, you know, I pushed the broom in prison once. And then Jelly Roll's like, hold on, let me hop in the booth. And Dwight's like, I don't know about this. He's not like you're a professional singer or nothing. And then Jelly Roll does and does like a couple bars of a song called I'm Not Okay, which I really love. Every Jelly Roll song is like this. It's so good. Every Jelly Roll song is like your least favorite friend uh, making you regret asking asking how his day. Um, Getting on Call of Duty with a, a friend, like a few friends, and then a friend of a friend, and you're like, "How's everyone doing?" And then you immediately regret asking that. Has every time I hear a Jelly Roll song, I think, "Has your fat ass ever had a good day? <laughs> Has anything good ever happened to you?" Jesus, when he's not singing, he's like, "It's he's the most sad, like just sickeningly positive, fake positive guy." You know, a real like, oh, I love, I love everybody. I, I believe in second chances. I'm a devil with angel wings. I used to do dirt, but now I dig a garden. But all <laughs> his songs, he's just going through it all the time. He's so annoying. Um, I hated, I hated every second of the Jelly Roll scene. I hated how <laughs> he made a fool out of Dwight. Dwight's way smarter than him. Um, here's what I really hated. The whole the the fulcrum of the scene is that Jelly Roll is such a fucking amazing singer, like that that Dwight would hear it and it would knock his socks off. But the actual song they do is like it is so he Jelly Roll is not singing it. It is so lip synced. To in order to get Jelly Roll's voice to sound like like that, you need the same amount of machines that are required to keep an ALS patient alive. <laughs> the same half the power grid in Oklahoma is going towards correcting Jelly Roll's voice in the scene. Yeah, the the, the his, his hit single "I'm Not Okay" and the lyrics are like, "If you see me walking around one day, you you may think uh, I'm, I'm happy and gay, but the real the truth is I'm not okay." If uh, I saw you fo- walking around in my neighborhood, I would call the military. <laughs> I would, I would try, I would, I would call the, my senator and be like, five star rating in real life, send in the National Guard to kill this buffoon. <laughs> uh, no, the I'm not okay follows his breakout single, This Is Not Normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we get like uh, our first uh, celebrity cameo. But, um, Oh, we stuck the the other the other antagonist. I, I mentioned that he killed a Kansas City, a made guy from Kansas City. And, you know, for, for fans of uh, my favorite movie of all time, Casino, you already know that Kansas City has a fairly large mob presence. Tulsa apparently does not. But Kansas City regards Tulsa as their territory. And Neil McDonough sort of drops a dime to the boss of Kansas City, played by Frank Grillo. And I, I don't oh know about you, Felix, but but I, I, I always like seeing Grillo in anything. There's oh, like, my God. No, yeah. I, I, I love Grillo. But like in the, in the Great Plains states... Dwight Man- Manfredi was not aware that there were the occluded Italians, the hidden Italians yeah. in Kansas City <laughs> who are now yeah. causing problems for him. So, yeah, there are there are there are Italians in the Great Plains states, but they're but they're hidden. They are occluded. And in this season, they are making their presence felt. Yeah. Grillo is presumably the son of Artie from Casino, the guy who. um didn't know his grocery store was bugged <laughs> and com- complained about all the details of the entire criminal conspiracy to his mom. Um, I mean, because he, I mean, Grillo's character even says, you know, 
I was gifted the Great Plains by my father. And who else could that be? You know, Artie Piscano, Artie Piscano, K- Remo, Casey Gajibol. Underboss. Yeah, why take a chance? <laughs> but yeah, no, like the cast is like part of this is because it's Taylor Sheridan verse, but it really is like my personal TV all stars. Like Martin Starr, Martin Starr is like a lifelong TV prodigy. You know, Freaks and Geeks, Freaks and Geeks, Party um, Down, Party Silicon Down. Valley. He's great in every. I love Martin Starr. He's awesome. Even if his character here, they really don't quite know what to do with it. I feel like Taylor Sheridan has a little bit of Dwight in him, and he just saw Martin Starr and was like, "Computer guy." And and didn't think any further. But, Taylor Sheridan. But, Taylor Sheridan has the same attitude about people with glasses as Pol Pot did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Frank Grillo. Frank Grillo is if you want someone that will play like a, a an overly intense middle aged guy who does uh, swinging. Frank Grillo is your. You cannot get. You cannot have a better choice than Frank Grillo. And Felix, Neil I, McDonough. I, I, <laughs> Neil, Neil McDonough, McDonough, yeah. Neil McDonough is like like every time I I see Neil McDonough, not Man of Brothers, but like in, in this type of thing, it's like, oh my god! Finally, this show is getting a villain that's into rough trade. <laughs> he's so good at playing those guys. I'm sure he's a sweetheart in real life, but like he's so he's so he should play Marty Perez in the New Republic movie. <laughs> Uh, the fact that they don't the fact, the fact that they don't look anything alike is no nah, no, it, no mere obstacle <laughs> to an actor of his ta- caliber would be no yeah, obstacle neil Marty mcdonough Perez. the most the most fucking like uh fucking scotch irish looking freak on the planet is gonna play uh marty Perez, the the gnome like uh publisher of the <laughs> new republic and yeah. uh a, alleged fan of you know uh, shall we say rough, tr- rough trade. The liaisons of a certain variety. He's into the labor movement. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, Mar- Marty Perez, who gets up and sharpens his face every morning, played by Neil McDonough, who really just looks like a polar bear. He looks like a Coca-Cola <laughs> yeah, yeah, polar bear. I mean, that, and I mean that as a compliment. I love how he looks. I wish it, I looked it's like his, his icy blue eyes. He's like, what, like a, one of those dogs, like a Malamute or a Husky or something. Yeah, oh my, That's what he yeah. reminds me of. Yeah. They even, in, 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 in fucking uh, Justified, they even describe it, like a witness describes him as a man who looks like a Husky. Which I thought was so funny. Uh, back to uh, back to Frank Grillo for a second. Uh, he's playing the, the the yeah the the, the mob boss of Kansas City, Bill Bevilacqua, <laughs> on this series, and like basically <laughs> he's dad. just a he's a guy he's a he's a guy uh, for, you know he's moved out to the Plain States and he's basically like a guy with dark hair and brown eyes who also wears a cowboy hat and like shoots ski. That, that's how you know he's been in Kansas City for his whole life. But I'm wondering, Felix, we're talking about great Frank Grillo performances. And I'm wondering if you remember my favorite uh, Frank Grillo casting when uh, the, the producers of Billions cast him as an artist. Oh, that, my. That was <laughs> when, when he was that, a mo- oh he was like a sort of like a fucking uh, Mark Rothko style modern yeah, artist he, he on was Billions. Like, they, they made <laughs> him like almost like Jackson Pollock. Like he would just splatter yeah. shit all around and be like, they represent my emotions like pissed. <laughs> Pissed, uh, happy, he's happy an, that I'm pissed. He's, a, he's, he's he's an artist that works in the medium of drywall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, just, there's an installation where just different girls go up to him and say something to him, and he just fucking busts a hole through the wall. Uh, he like he, I not since the casting of uh of Tom Hardy to play like a vice journalist have I been so delighted by that kind of a casting choice. It's like he he's he's an artist and like his art is so good that even Bobby acts is like, like, I'll give you 30 million dollars to make these bullshit splattery things <laughs> like it, it, the most it, he could play an artist. But one of those guys who makes like glossy like the, those uh, those things that Brad Trammell posts where it's like, yeah, yeah, where it's like a the, holographic they, 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 yeah. million dollar bill with the Joker at the center of it. <laughs> where like you you get a golden desert eagle and then you cover it in lucite and make like a giant paperweight. And then there's also Scarface is involved. In yeah. 
That like if he played that kind of and that is like the Bobby Axelrod would like that stuff. I don't believe for a second that Bobby Ax would be into modern art, but he does. Of course, he fucks Maggie Schiff, but then yeah. he 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 kind of realizes Bobby's designs and he's like, I he, this made me turn my back on the most important thing to me, art, and all his art is just like the fu- the fucking like finger paint by a three year old <laughs> and not even a smart one. <laughs> Uh, also, also my fa- one of my also one of my favorite aspects of Tulsa King is the repeated um, uh, sort of cutaways to uh, what's going on back in the city of New York, the the place where Dwight has been exiled from, and his Brooklyn crime family that that he's on the outs with, who sent him to Tulsa to like just shut him up and hope that he dies out there. To now he's in open war with them, and uh, the Brooklyn crime family is headed by Dominic uh, Lombanz- Lombard Lombardzazo from The Wire and uh, various other movies like The Irishman. But he, he's always good. But like back to the Felix, what you talked about, the, the sort of dreamlike quality to the writing on this show. Whenever they cut back to Brooklyn, they're, like, they, they signify because you see like a Manhattan skyline and you see the brownstones in Brooklyn. And you're like, oh, just in case. I, I was worried for a second I wasn't in Tulsa, but like, I'm glad I didn't know where I am. And like when they cut to Tulsa, they'll have some shit kicking music like Jelly Roll. And then when they cut back to Brooklyn, they'll have like, a Bobby Darren song like "Oh Sweetie Baby" playing just to just to sort of <laughs> yeah. fore- foreground you and where you are. So like they'll go to the the you know the Italian social club where they do all of their not business because most of what the mafia is in the show is like taking phone calls and being like, "Yeah, I heard about that thing. No, nah, I'm not going to do that thing. All right, let me call you back and we'll talk about that thing." Like that, that that's mostly what they do all day. <laughs> yeah, it is there's there's one great line. There's one, there one great line where. Uh, the guy who plays Lucky Luciano on Boardwalk Empire gets a call and it says potential spam. And he goes, how, how, do, how the fuck do they know if it's spam or potential spam? AI my cock. <laughs> <laughs> I love how current the show is. They yeah, talk yeah. about real issues. AI my fucking cock. And like, but like, it, it's that kind of writing. Cause like when, when like the, the, the boss walks into like the, the social club where the boys are playing pinochle and drinking wine and, you know. <laughs> listening to oh sweetie baby on the the phonograph <laughs> like he walks in and they're like hey what's the difference between a cocktail waitress and a stripper and they're like i don't know what and they're like about two weeks and they're like oh they're laughing it, it up is, and then the boss walks in and he's like you fucking you fucking morose guy got nothing better to do than laugh and tell jokes all day oh and they're like and then the, the, it just stops there's nothing that, like it doesn't go any further he's like you yeah you, you, your mama looks like laughing so much. You should, you should go on Comic View on BET. <laughs> <laughs> you should go open for Bruce, Bruce. <laughs> I, that's him trying to encourage them. <laughs> you should develop your talents and put yourself out there. The worst that happens is you make some friends, you fucking mook. He, well, I, I love that because it's like, is this your first day in the mafia? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this That's is all, you, all these he's, guys do. He's getting mad at guys for not doing work. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, one of my favorite jokes uh, in this, one of my favorite meta textual jokes of The Sopranos always was whenever uh, Tony would get into an argument with like Carmelo or the kids, he would go, I bust my ass all fucking day or for what? <laughs> and every time you see him working, they're just doing that. They're just telling stupid <laughs> jokes in like a clubhouse. They're eating they're Yeah. They're eating a sit They're They're playing cards and each eating a sandwich that contains a whole pig's worth of pork in it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just watching, like watching Matlock and being like, whatever happened to Deborah winger? She was a piece of ass. <laughs> I, I, my guess is she'll be on season three of Tulsa King as a love interest to Slack Stallone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, Dana Delaney is picking up the slack on this episode, uh, on this season. But, like, uh, again, back to the way, like, this show just will, like, it, introduce, like, a scene and then just end it. They do the same thing with characters, like the ATF girlfriend, where after she testifies that uh, they did indeed have several roles in the hay and he was a generous lover who, uh, you know, m- made, made sure that she was sexually gratified before uh, putting on a Frank Sinatra record and lip syncing to it for 30 minutes. Before I learned <laughs> how to play violin from this guy named Dan in the joint. Uh, he's like, as she's leaving the courthouse, he's like, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I think you and I, we shared something really special. And then she's like, okay, but I don't, I do not feel that way anymore. It's time for my character to leave the show. I'm, I'm being reassigned to Alaska. Bye. And then oh, she yeah, walks out of the courthouse. She says, I'm being, I'm well, 
I'm being reassigned to Anchorage. He goes, in Alaska? And she's like, is there any other one? And he goes, I don't know. And that's the last thing they ever say to each other. You know what? You know what the tonality of the dialogue is like? It's like Cobra. Cobra was dreamlike in this exact same way. Like when Bridget Nielsen is like, could you ever, could you let yourself, could you ever let yourself fall in love? And Stallone goes, with a woman? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or after Bridget Nielsen is almost murdered and sees one of her friends get brutally killed and fucking uh, Stallone and his idiot uncle are, are like in her <laughs> hospital yeah. room, like playing with the stethoscope and like yeah. fucking around and eating candy. <laughs> <laughs> eating candy, playing with the medical equipment. And yeah, like his partner is like, please don't mind my friend who has eight matches sticking out of his mouth and is drooling on you. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna consult you about your near murder and rape. And he's he's like, hey, you got any jujubes for me? <laughs> <laughs> the uncle is literally sucking a giant lollipop. Oh, well, there's a lot of lollipops in this season because uh, one of the things I also like is, is the scenes where um, Dwight gets high. Because you know oh, he's got to yes. sample the product, so they do. I really think in the, in this season they did a conscious throwback to everyone's favorite moment from season one, i.e., in a long car ride in Oklahoma, where Dwight uh, he takes an edible and then talks about trans people, where he's like, <laughs> what, "What the fuck is up with all these pronouns these days? They got they got they theirs he him she her. They got got too many in the in the joint. We only had one pronoun. It was uh, it was a you." <laughs> yeah, I used to live. I used to live in a DIY house in Philly, and they said socks got to clean the dishes. I said, "How's a sock going to clean the dishes?" And they said, "Sock is our new roommate." And I said, "How's a sock going to pay rent?" <laughs> so they they have another they have another scene exactly like that in 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 this season where they're they're driving out to do some business. They're driving out to to close a new business deal that will buy them a, several thousand wind turbines that they will use to power their weed growing business, which is like it makes no fucking sense. It's so <laughs> it's, 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 it's bizarre. They're going to buy uh, not even constructed. They're going to buy like uh, so, so the right to farm wind on an Indian reservation and divert that power to a hydroponic grow laboratory so that they can sell more marijuana. This is like the scheme they were trying to do with the logs in Zorba the Greek, <laughs> <laughs> but like even more harebrained. <laughs> I cannot figure it out for the life so, of me what their contraptions are supposed to do. They they have a long car ride and like Stallone has gone off those edibles and they're talking about how uh, the guy that they just met or the guy that they're going to meet is named Med Hat because he's a Native American. He's like, a, you know, has tribal land and he, he has the rights to this to this wind to this as of yet unconstructed wind farm that they're going to get running in like a month time, a month's time. He's like, how long do we get these wind turbines up and build our grow house? And they're like, I don't know, about a week. So <laughs> he's like, they're like, hey, hey, glasses, Martin Starr, you're smart. What does Med Hat mean? He's like, uh, Medicine Hat is a city in Alberta. And then they could start talking about like uh, the the young driver character. Uh, I think his name is Tyson. He's like, "Hey, hey, man! Like anyone named after a city? That's just weird." And then they're like, "What about what about Sidney Pollock?" And like the Garrett Headlands character says, "What about Sidney Pollock?" There is absolutely no way on earth his character would be aware of the director and actor Sidney Pollock. No, it is like <laughs> they're le like what they think like these the average Oklahoman would know is insane that could this be the most unrealistic thing in the show actually th this is a guy who's brilliant this again another brilliant uh caper that they a score that they that they pull off on the show that's like G garrett headland has a brilliant idea to be like hey what if we steal catalytic converters and they're like are you fucking stupid like that's like the most penny anti-crime you can do and he's like okay but what if i told you we weren't stealing one catalytic converter we're going to steal a dozen of them. And they're like, hey, oh, that's 200 bucks each. Think about that. Think about that. <laughs> Think about all that. <laughs> Think about all those clams in your pocket. I love that Taylor Sheridan put the catalytic converter storyline ripped from the headlines into the show. You know, Taylor Sheridan, I can tell that Taylor Sheridan is a, uh, he follows the crime blotter. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm even more surprised that he made the protagonist do it. So we, we touched a little bit on Neil McDonough's character and, how fucking bizarre their introduction is the scene where like Dwight and Tyson and everyone go to the casino. And, and like the reason they're going is because Dwight's like, 
I, you know, I, I, I think you're supposed to meet uh, inspirational people that inspire you to. Do he wants better. the Lincoln build with entrepreneurs yeah. like himself. It's yeah. so weird. Like he's not he, he, like he makes everyone in his crew buy an individual outfit so they can go to a charity gala at Neil McDonough's house, and they're like, "Hey, we gotta make a good impression. When you you represent me, you gotta look good in the suit." And there's even a montage of them trying on clothes set to Sharp Dressed Man by ZZ Top, which I really appreciated. I love that. Yeah, Martin Starr shows up in like a Sergeant Pepper outfit. And then it's just like the joke is that they're all just in regular suits at the end. And the old guy's like, you're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it. Yeah. Um, So so they show up and he's like, "Okay, we're here to Lincoln build with one of the richest, most powerful men in Oklahoma. And then Dana Delaney introduces them. And Neil McDonough is like, I've heard that the weather out on the plains strikes you as bad. And he's like, sometimes the weather is nice to me, but not when I'm being threatened. And then he's like, I think you'll find if you stay in Oklahoma, you will be threatened. And then he's just like, okay, I gotta go. It's so weird. It's so weird because this guy is like a legit billionaire. And he's like, he says to this charity gala and he sees this simpleton surrounded by people in like ill-dressed suits. One of them literally dressed up like Nick Cannon from uh drumline, Martin Starr. <laughs> Um, and and he's, he's like, oh my God, this simpleton who steals catalytic converters and sells CBD on an app, (laughs) he's going to compete with me in the, on like the, um, like the billionaire racket. Like he's like, this is the, like, uh, you know, he's going to go against me for like defense contracts. Dwight the general. He he currently owns and operates a bar and two dispensaries and neil mcdonough's character is supposed to be the richest man in oklahoma and he's like i think you'll find that the competition matters when it's who you're competing against is what counts and then he's it's like so, right, like neil mcdonough, <laughs> neil mcdonough seeing this 83 year old man who's selling cbd to like god knows who and he's like oh so you're you're trying to take everything that i have huh <laughs> <laughs> I know. In the same episode, they're stealing a dozen catalytic converters out of a car dealership to, to like, hey, this is our big score. But then they, you see, they're always business minded. It's not just that you steal the catalytic converters. Then you give it back to the car dealer. You give half of them back to the car dealership and then buy the car dealership. That's yeah. business mindset. Most gen- and another another score that made, uh, by the way, another score that made absolutely no sense. Zero they rip sense. off. They, they rip off, and like, and the, like they, they they're able to get onto a, a, the the lot of a car dealership just by cutting through a chain link fence, and then like their crew is like twelve doofuses who are going to go <laughs> under every single car and saw off the catalytic converters and then leave um, unmolested. Then the, then is- the guy, then the car dealership guy is like, "Hey, I know you stole those catalytic converters, and if I don't get them back, my business is going to suffer." But just could you be nice and send them back to us? And then they're like, yes, we will. But we'll also buy your business. Dwight schemes make about 3% more sense than the Sons of Anarchy schemes. I think they're at least <laughs> cash flow positive, which is yeah. more than I can say about the Sons. But, like, at, least, but the, at least the Sons are doing crimes in like recognized field of uh, crime, like uh, muling coke and dealing AK 47. Yeah. Do all of Dwight's th- schemes are like, you know, hey, we found out that the water rights for the city of Tulsa are being auctioned off. So I'm going to. I'm going to steal the dog of the water commissioner and then pretend to give it back. It's just like... The, the typical Dwight scheme is like, we're going to go into an office building. We're going to put on masks. We're going to take the fax machine. And then we're going <laughs> to... Yeah, Felix, gonna, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of Ricky and Julian schemes on yeah, Trailer exact, Park West. Exactly. Where they show up in an office and start taking out the office furniture, just pretending they're movers. Like that, that, that is Dwight's schemes for getting into every business. Like he will see a story in the newspaper about like, oh, like, you know, the, the yuan rises on the international monetary market. And he's like, they got money over in China. I'm going to get down on that. I'm going to get. It's just like, yeah. and then they some- go to a Chinese restaurant and steal all the sauce packets, <laughs> steal all the duck sauce, and then yeah. sell it to uh, like a barbecue restaurant. Yeah, that is the typical Dwight scheme. But like, it, it is so, it is literally like if Jeff Bezos met Ricky and Julian and was like, I see you coming for me. <laughs> yeah. like, same, same, just as ridiculous. <laughs> but okay, so. 
Could you follow what was going on at all with the Neil McDonough subplots? I watched it okay. uh, several oh my- times. Yeah. <laughs> it's Felix, so the, weird. They, they, they introduce his character and he's like, okay, he knows Dana Delaney because he likes buying horses. A typical rich thing to guy to do. He's growing weed on his property. And, and, but also, but like with the Chinese mafia, he's like, yeah. he's done a deal with the Chinese mafia who are growing weed and poppies. On his on his property in Oklahoma, and then like in the in the fourth episode, there's they try to introduce this pl- plot line where he's like he knows that his Chinese gangster business partners are growing and processing opium on his legal weed farm, and he's like, hey, I didn't sign on for this. This is this is not cool, not cool, guys. Get those poppies out of here. It's more trouble than it's worth. And then they're like, okay, we'll do that. Then they like catch two of their like. Two of their slaves stealing. And by the way, the scene with like the Chinese workers, they were dressed like they were from like the 19th century and we just yeah. arrived in, in San Francisco to build a railroad. They were, they, they were subject to the exclusion act of Woodrow yeah. Wilson. <laughs> they were wearing, they were wearing like those pointy hats and like they black had, pajamas, <laughs> like the VC. <laughs> yeah. like, so where like, did you dress these guys? So, so Neil McDonough is like they have them. They're like two of the two of two of their slaves have been caught stealing weed. <laughs> They've been caught stealing gummies from him, and they like tie them up outside. And Neil McDonough is like, "Translate, I want them all to hear this." And he's like, "I offer you the American dream, and all you had to do was show some work ethic and not steal." And now these two men are going to pay the price. And he starts like cutting a switch. And then his Chinese partner just shoots both of them in the head. And he's, and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing, man? I thought we were just going to scare him. I thought we were going to, I was going to yeah. talking to about business, about a work ethic and best business practices. And then there's this like 20 second lingering shot of Neil McDonough looking extremely disturbed at the Chinese business partner who we all thought was just like a throwaway character yeah. that Neil McDonough was going to kill. It's so, like they set Neil McDonough up as this big, scary bad guy, but he's instantly like terrorized and hoed out by his most <laughs> replaceable henchman. <laughs> and, like, and that's, you know, so you can see that scene, he, he literally was cutting a switch and he was like, I'm going to do this in front of all of you Chinese people to teach you a lesson about how we deal with shoplifters here in America. And then his Chinese partner just shoots both of them in the head. And he's like, I was just going to paddle their hides a little bit. I was going to tan their backside a little bit. Like, and also like this guy's like a billionaire, but his weed operation is so fucking like nickel and dime. They're just in like a rand, like a greenhouse that I don't know, like a 400 square foot greenhouse and every, he has like a dozen idiots hand picking like mids. Yeah. That's, what, that's like, probably why like the scene, it's like Dwight. the scene. Of, it, it's like the scene where they like there's an apartment and it's like a drug processing lab and they have like 18 women who are stripped naked wearing like you know surgical masks and like you know uh, plastic goggles on, just like diming up fucking crack, just like you know carving off crack and, and putting it in little baggies. He's got that, but it's like he has uh, 30 Chinese slaves. Uh, separating the seeds out from like a shoebox worth of weed. And they're like, this shipment has got to get to the high school parking lot by three o'clock <laughs> stat or, yeah. or I'm out of business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he, he's like, if you were in the petroleum business and you're like, this is going pretty well, <laughs> but what if I, what if I sold weed at a profit margin of $10 for every hundred kilograms? <laughs> Uh, I mean, like, that's, I mean, that's the thing I love about this show is that nobody's schemes make any fucking sense at all. Nor does the show attempt to explain them, even in the slightest. It's just steel catalytic converters, uh, buy car dealership, and wind turbines equals criminal empire. It's because like, remember the scene where wait remember the scene where he tries to get a loan from the bank for seven million dollars, and they're like, no, obviously not. And then he's like, okay, bye. Okay, it's another scene that just ends. He just yeah. leaves without. It's like, what was he, the point of that? <laughs> he it was yeah. like he needs he needs seven million dollars to buy wind turbines from a guy he met in Central Booking, who he like told he who he imparted life advice from a like a like a lifelong felon about how not to get raped in prison, and then like like uh, everything with Dwight, the guy's like I'm in jail because I defrauded the government out of wind turbine subsidies that I gambled away, and he's like okay, but if anyone asks you for the salt in prison, you say. I'm going to take this salt and put it through your fucking skull. 
or else you know you could be wearing nail polish and enter into the enter into a bitch for the next twenty years. Um, so he so he gets the idea. He hears that some other idiot who's in prison now uh, got twelve million dollars for doing wind in the wind business, and he's like, once again, he has an idea. He's like, I, hey. I gotta, I gotta start making money off wind. And then he goes to the bank. Is like, I need twelve million dollars to buy wind turbines. And they're like, No, we're we're a commercial bank that does we like we do mortgages, and we certainly wouldn't give you a loan. And then he's like, Okay, bye. But then in the next scene, they're like doing a deal to buy the wind turbines from the Native American reservation. It's yeah, I think they like kept that scene in because it's f- like supposed to be really funny because like the the bank lady like they they introduce um like. Stallone is there with Tyson and like when they meet the branch manager who tells them that they literally can't loan them that much money, you know, the junior banker they're talking to goes, this is uh, Mr. Manfredi and his partner, uh, Tyson and Tyson goes <laughs> business partner. And I, they, yeah. they like Stallone apparently has never heard that joke that has been that joke has been in movies and shows for like 45 years. At this I point. think Stallone just got out of prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. If they if they were like, we don't care how little sense the scene makes and how little it does for the plot, we have to keep it in because that partner jo- I've never heard it before. But like going back to how like none of the crimes or schemes make any sense, that is because I think that you know Taylor Sheridan is like he probably like like a Mormon with their magic underwear. He probably wears a full Eagle Scout costume under his clothes every day. Taylor Sheridan, Taylor Sheridan is like the closest thing we have to like a real life Ned Flanders. So this is him trying to concoct like what a crime is. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, Oh, like, Oh, Oh, um, a typical crime for like a mafia captain. Uh, it would be to get out of late fees at blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> there's another subplot with the uh because Stallone moves his family into like a new neighborhood and there's a su- there's a subplot with Dan Bacadal who plays the the HOA guy who keeps finding him for having his garage door open. And then oh, another another goat of TV, Bacadal. Yeah. Oh yeah, Dan ba- will remember. Beep? Oh, forget about it. Uh, but I mean that's another plot. It's another little digression that goes absolutely nowhere because the guy finds out that he's like notorious criminal Dwight the General Manfredi, and then he just comes over and he's like, "Oh yeah, all all the HOA fees. I'm just gonna waive them. Sorry, bye." And then and what? Yeah, like uh, what did he think Dwight was before? Uh, yeah, <laughs> but Felix, it's another example about how like nothing bad can happen to Dwight. Like there is no obstacle that he is that he is presented with that he doesn't surmount within five minutes of screen time. Yeah, another like, per- like, another per- I- another perfect example is I'm going to talk about like the scene where Frank Grillo comes to see him at the Buck Broken Saloon, and then he's like, "I don't know if you heard or not, Tulsa's my town, and you're going to start kicking up to me." And then Dwight's like, "Yeah, well, I'm I, I'm not going to do that." And then he's like, "All right, but I'm going to send my I'm going to send this other guy that, who's with me now. He's going to come back later and offer you another deal." And then he's like, "Okay," so then like he sent so Frank Grillo sends a guy back to meet with Dwight and kill him. And the guy he sends to do it, his plan to do it is like, let's just say, okay, I'm going to come back and uh, we're going to ask Dwight to come outside to talk business. And then when he does, at at his own establishment, surrounded by his own guys, I'm just going to take out a gun and shoot him. (laughs) Yeah, which like, after the meeting you they had, why would Dwight, it's so stupid because like the Frank Grillo literally all but says in that meeting, I'm like, going to kill like, you, like kick up to me or I'll kill you. And he's like, oh, you're not kicking up to me. Well, OK, maybe I'm you'd sending, like to kick up I'm to my saying, friend I'm, when he comes back. <laughs> why would you have to send a different guy to give him a different offer? Like, <laughs> like that, that is so fucking like, oh, OK, I'm out of offers for today. I, like, I, my, my ultra is 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 giving offers to Dwight the general and I, I'm out of mana. <laughs> and like the way the scene is set up, it's like the Grillo and the New York guys have made an offer to one of Frank's one of Dwight's like capos or whatever. It's like some other New York City guy who's now living in Oklahoma. I don't remember his character, nor do I care. But they're like, hey, if you kill Dwight, we'll make you the Tulsa King. And then he's like, Ugh. I'm not saying no to it. It's an offer I could entertain, but if you could just send another guy to make the same offer, hey, then we're talking business here. 
And then like you think that he's betrayed Dwight, but they just walk outside, see this guy, and he's like, like he the, the, he sent one guy to kill Dwight. And Dwight has like five dudes surrounding him. And the dude just takes out a gun like he's gonna kill him, and then they just grab and stab him to death. It's like it had no the scene had zero tension and was over before it even started. The guy just showed up and he's like, Hey, I'm here to do the other deal. And then he pulls out a gun and they just stab him to death. That's it. I guess they were trying to build him up, but like if you had Dwight facing down like an aircraft carrier, there'd be no tension. Fucking dumbass Dwight would find a way out of it. He always does. But against one guy, it begs the question why it was even in the show, or much less as a climactic moment. Uh, if Dwight faced off against an aircraft carrier, he would uh, see a headline in the Tulsa, Oklahoma local newspaper about how they're powered by nuclear reactors, and he'd be like, hey, we should build one of those and sell it to the Navy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do you have any, do you, do you have like, any protons <laughs> lying around? And Martin Starr is like, well, I was saving them for a special occasion, but fine. I was saving them to create a new strain of marijuana, but I suppose, yeah. we'll, but I suppose we're selling nuclear reactors to the government now. Hey, they should call you a nuclear reactor because you have a bad reaction to stuff. <laughs> yes. And then they all laugh and the scene ends. Uh, I, I, I want to I return, though, to the scene where Dwight is off those gummies in the car and uh, just sort of yucking it up with Martin Starr, where he gets confused about the band fish and he thinks it's a, a fish fish and not and not an improv, imp, as Martin Starr refers to them, an improvisational rock group inspired by the Grateful Dead. You should really listen to them. Why does he think that Dwight would be into fish? That is just a crucial misunderstanding of his character. Like, maybe he will like them. They show Dwight as like, taking to modernity and things he missed out on very well but like if if this if dwight were you know a more a less fantastical character he's not listening to anything made after 1965 would you like to listen to this song that features a 30 minute ukulele solo yeah to me but like the but dwight's like sort of uh, off the edible story that he tells where he starts rambling about how important music is to his life is genius comedy because he like, he tells this rambling story about how he was like, I was on the low East side and I was a little bit drunk. Scratch that. I was a lot bit drunk. They called the lower East side, the gateway to America at one time. It was like, he, he tells stories like grandpa Simpson. He was like, yeah. I was on the lower East side wearing an onion around my belt, which was the style of the time. So he tells a story about how he walks into this dank club on the Lower East Side and is so drunk, he, he goes to sleep on a speaker and then loses part of the hearing in his ear because they start playing the song On the Road Again. And the whole time you think this is a, about how he likes the song On the Road Again. But no, it's a song about how he's angry at the people who wrote and produced that song because he lost his earring, hearing after falling asleep on a speaker on the Lower East Side in 1905. How is that their fault? <laughs> this is the world. This is the this is the Casper Hauser style world that Dwight inhabits. He is yeah. he's, he's a one of one. Yeah, yeah, Dwight. Yeah, it, if you told me that Dwight's character learned to read five years before the events of the show, I would believe you. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I, I, have we missed any major event from the first four episodes of Tulsa King? No. Well, because okay. I did want uh, just one really major one and it's Dwight's sister and of course first of all the age the ages in the show are all weird Dwight has a lot younger sister and by younger I mean possibly 45 years younger <laughs> <laughs> Dwight is 83 years old and his sister is what like 40 um but you know that is that's a little goofy casting but what I think they did do really well on, and this is very Annab sorry, Annabella Sciorra is 20 years younger than Sly Stallone. <laughs> One thing I thought was well done about this, and I think true to life, is that the real Dwight Manfredi's sister, and in, in, the, in the quantum sense that I think all TV characters do have personhood in, in a, in a quantum, quantum sense, this is sort of central to my religion, the real Dwight Manfred, the general Manfredi's sister, would be a fedora woman, as her character is. <laughs> yes, that's not. That's the first thing we notice about her. She's a fedora. She lady. wears a big hat. She wears one of those yeah. big floppy cowboy hats that women love. Yeah, exact type of woman who would wear that hat. But she's also a lawyer. She's a high-powered lawyer, and she's like 
you know, Dwight, you should get a good lawyer and not just yourself for your federal bribery case. And he's like, oh, what a, this costs a lot of fucking money. Uh, she's I, not really, they, they don't really involve her in many storylines. No, she's, she's just like, uh, she's like, Dwight, I, I get the sense something's wrong. And he's like, nothing's wrong. It's going to be okay. What are you talking about? And she's like, don't lie to me, Dwight. I know there's something wrong. And he's like, I killed the main guy uh, when I could have done a deal with him. And now all our lives are in danger. And she's like, Dwight, not again. <laughs> That's basically her character. <laughs> yeah. But that, yeah, I think that that about sums it up. We're only four episodes deep and we will like we will have to have Brian on for the wrap up. I am very excited to see where this goes. I do you think they're implying that Neil McDonough's character will have to team up with Dwight? to um take down his henchmen who he's scared of i i think there's a good chance we could see an alliance between neil mcdonough and sylvester stallone to fight the the, the chinese menace the yeah yellow peril I, in oklahoma that, yeah that's gonna happen and dwight will be like i'll help you out with your chinese problem but one with i got one condition you have to give me an oil rig and that's how <laughs> dwight gets into the petroleum business uh, 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 Stallone learns about a an oppressed ethnic and religious and minority in China, and he was like, "Back in my day, that we just called those that was white guys who liked rap music." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we are we're, we're we're very excited to see where the show goes. I as difficult to follow as it was at times. I do kind of like the new dreamlike quality that the show has. It's very, it, it, a lot of things are different from the first season. The first season seems like a little more madcap and more standard Taylor Sheridan fare, where this is one of the most confusing shows on TV right now, <laughs> to, to be honest yeah, with you. It really but is. But I am, I'm very excited to see the rest regardless. Yeah, I'll be watching every episode and uh, we will be back to recap the, uh, the season. What, see, the season two finale happens. We will definitely get Brian back on to discuss the rest of Tulsa King, but we're very excited where, where, where this season is going or not going, I should say. <laughs> can I ask about one of the, pro I, I did not watch this, but can I ask about one of the plot lines from the first one, if it comes back, yeah. uh, the, the nitrous gang? Oh, oh, right, yeah. right. Uh, they're not around this season. Okay, I was yeah, just wondering no. because you know, Nitrous yeah. has really had a pop in culture this summer between the Kanye thing and all the Galaxy Gas videos, and I kept thinking, you know, Tulsa King kind of prescient on that. That's right. No, uh, the the Nitrous Gang is just one of the many like penny anti rackets that Dwight has taken over for. Uh, the, uh, every every week, the Nitrous Gang are kicking up five dollars to him <laughs> for, for selling balloons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like every week they come in they're like they give him an envelope and they're like that's for you boss and there's change inside of it <laughs> uh, all right so yeah that's 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 that's, that's the first season, first half of season two of tulsa king and i think we'll we'll leave it there for today yeah uh but uh some business to discuss i would just like to remind everyone uh to buy matt christmas book uh, to check out chopotraphouse.store for some new t-shirts and merchandise and all